and we're live. Good evening uh, and welcome to the planning committee on Thursday the 20th of August 2020. Uh, are there any apologies for absence? Uh, I've received an apology from Councillor Linda Kirby and Councillor Dehaney is substituting so uh, thank you, Councillor Dehaney, for substituting. Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any declarations of pecuniary interests? Uh, no. I just want to add that uh, I, in fact, declare that I do on occasions chair the design review panel, uh, but uh, no decisions are actually made by myself. Thank you. Are the previous minutes agreed? Uh, sorry, Councillor, we have um, um, Councillor uh, Makin with um, declarations oh, of interest. Sorry, Councillor Bacon. Right. I have to declare that I attended a meeting with the residents of Russell Road. My intention was to ensure that they knew what the process was and what they can and cannot say regarding plague issues. At no time during this meeting did I state my views on the application. Unless advised otherwise, I intend to participate and vote on the application. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dean? Uh, yeah, is Imperial Fields being um, considered yes. tonight? Yes. So, so I've been working with Imperial Field uh, with the Tooting team uh, for a number of decades, and uh, I think I regard them as partners or friends. Um, so I won't be voting on that one. Okay. Uh, any more declarations? Sorry, Cal Cal Councillor Macon. In which relation was your um, de um, declaration in, please? Which item? Eleven, I think. Okay. It's the Russell Road one. Or pretty sure present. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and are the previous minutes agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Right. So before we start, uh, and for the benefit of the general public, I I'd like to briefly explain how the planning committee works. Uh, first of all, most importantly, all, all applications will be heard this evening and decisions will be made. So firstly, the planning officer will introduce the application and present their report. Uh, after this, uh, time is then given to the objectors uh, to speak with a maximum of six minutes and two speakers. Uh, if you have requested to speak, I have your uh, name on my list uh, and I will call out your name. The agent uh, or applicant are then allowed an equal amount of time, uh, again, with a maximum uh, of two speakers. The planning officer will then be given uh, an opportunity to offer any comments that they may have. Uh, and after that, uh, time is going to be given to any local ward councillors who've actually uh, requested and registered to speak. Uh, now, normally, in, in, if we were in the council chamber, we, we have a, a traffic light system. But uh, because this is a virtual meeting, <coughs> the planning officer will remind you when you have one minute left to speak. So please, if you could uh, spend the last minute emphasizing your main points because your microphone, unfortunately, will be switched off after that one minute. Right, so onto the agenda. I'd like to keep the order as per the agenda, uh, apart from items 12 and 13, which I would like to swap around uh, as there are no speakers for item 12. So if we can move on to the first item on the agenda, please, uh, which is three Allen Road, Wimbledon and uh, Officer Bryson, I'd be grateful if you could present it. Thank you. Chair, yeah, just going to share my screen, but give me a sec. Uh, thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can, you can see the uh, plan in front of you. Uh, the application site is number three, Allen Road, within um, Wimbledon Village. Um, it is a, a large detached property, um, which is listed and within the um, conservation area. This existing roof plan. The proposal itself is for various extensions and alterations to the existing property, uh, including a basement, um, and also a new front dormer window, replacement side extension and single storey rear extension. Uh, so the existing dwelling itself, as you can see, uh, a character property, 
uh, with various various traditional features. Um, that is the existing front elevation, existing rear, uh, existing east side, and existing west side. Proposal itself. So this is the proposed basement plan um, adjoining at the rear of the property. So large part of it is under the existing dwelling itself, and then extending out underneath a small part of the rear garden. Proposed ground floor plan, so the replacement uh, single story side garage here, uh, new single story rear extension at the back, and some various internal alterations. Uh, there's no first floor extensions as such, um, just creating new, um, new large bay windows at the back. Uh, replacement windows throughout the building, uh, upgrading with new timber windows. Uh, top floor level, a new front dormer window here to match the other one. So looking at elevations, there are some new side windows being proposed. That is the side of the proposed rear single store extension. From the front, this is the proposed side extension for the garage that you can see here. A new dormer window at the front and at the back single story rear extension here and there's the rear of the side extension proposed. Looking at the side plan, so the western side plan will replace existing single story out but as you see dotted in green with the new one and then the basement underneath as well. Turning to site pictures, view from the front, uh, the building is somewhat, I'm a, li a little bit tired um, so the proposal would enhance the building. Um, from the front again, Looking at the rear, so a single story extension here. This would be replaced with the taller single story side extension. Another view from the rear here. The case officer did visit the adjoining uh, neighbor number um, one to the west and viewed it from the uh, side windows. This is a view from the first floor side window. Uh, so this here below would be replaced with a taller roof, um, would be visible from there. And these are two existing ground floor side windows which serve a TV room slash study at number one, uh, which face the application site to the side. And again, from further back down the side, so the application site's on the right, the neighbor's property on the left. Uh, this would be demolished and rebuilt with the roof angling up and away. Uh, Chair, I'll draw your attention now to the modification sheet um, where we've had additional representation and also response from the applicant. Um, which hopefully you've had time to di digest. Um, overall, officers are satisfied with the proposal and recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Officer Bryson. The first speaker I have is Louise Lawson. Louise, are you are you there? Louise Lawson? Uh, Just bringing Louise into the room now, Chair. Okay, thank you. Louise uh, Lawson? Hello, yes, I'm here now. Thank you very much. You have three minutes. Uh, Good please. evening. I live at One Allen Road and have looked forward to the sympathetic restoration of Three Allen Road for a very long time. It's a prominent locally listed heritage asset in the Belvedere Conservation Area but I have many objections to this application. These have already resulted in 15 conditions being added, but it is still recommended. The applicant has far greater experience of Merton's planning process than me. So I've taken advice from a leading planning QC to prepare this. We believe the application should be refused for three reasons. Firstly, the two-story side extension. Apparently the applicant likes cars and wants a big garage, fine. But we strongly object to the size, design and location of this one, right on our boundary. At 16 meters long and over six meters tall, this is not a garage, it's a barn. The demolition of the original and rare motor car house will damage the historical significance of Three Allen Road and change the character of the whole street. Its replacement with this barn of totally different scale, height and appearance is disproportionate. It will result in elevational change that will cause substantial harm to the heritage asset itself and the conservation area. Our lovely neighbours, the Wimbledon Society and the council's own conservation officer have all said it should be smaller and subservient to the host building. Merton policy also requires respecting the space between buildings where it contributes to the character of the area. 
the importance of gaps between houses is emphasized in the conservation area character appraisal. If you approve this, the gap between one and three Allen Road would be totally eliminated, harming the sense of space and place and the rhythm of the streetscape. Harm caused to a conservation area must, by law, be given substantial weight and importance in your decision, with clear and convincing justification for it. This harm should not be accepted and the council should refuse permission. Secondly, Merton has a very clear straightforward policy to preclude extensions that diminish residents' living conditions. The boundary wall between numbers one and three is less than two metres from my house. Increasing its height from two one minute remaining. to over three, four metres and extending this will be extremely overbearing and result in a dreadful sense of enclosure, particularly on our ground floor living room. I have 12 windows on that side with only one on the other and I rely on them for light. I commissioned a report on the daylight that shows my light will be materially reduced if this goes ahead and the extension will clearly diminish the quality of my living conditions. Thirdly, this basement is not modest. It's bigger than the average three bedroom house and it's an environmental catastrophe. Merton seems to be drawing a distinction here between local and statutory listings. An application has been made to Historic England to put Three Allen Road on the statutory list, but we believe you can and should refuse permission for this basement under your existing policy to prevent excavation under listed buildings and their gardens. For all these reasons and many more, please reject this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I now have two, Naomi Dehan and Alistair Edmondson. Uh, are, are you sh are you sharing or is it only one of you speaking? Sorry, so it's just Alistair speaking. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, you have three minutes. I'd like to start by saying that we don't uh, oppose many of the renovation and modernisation plans for, for the application for Three Allen Road, and we agree that the house is in need of an update. And we're under no illusions that um, it will require a period of work and destruction and noise, and fully accept that. Um, however, there's aspects of the plans that cause us some concerns um, in respect to the reasonable enjoyment of our home, that's what neighbours, our privacy and the, and the overall character of the road. Uh, my wife and I moved to Five Allen Road two and a half years ago with the intention of laying down strong roots to grow our young family. Um, uh, we moved from a, a, a muse house in West London, so the proposed basement is a particular concern to us. Uh, we lived through at least five basement dig outs within close proximity to us and our previous home over the course of the years we spent there and we have no fond memories of those experiences getting away from further years of basement digging noise and dust on our, on our front door and now back garden was a key attraction to moving to five allen road and was very important to us um, as we're about to have our first child we find the prospect of our kids being subjected to the same experiences we were incredibly frustrating having selected a home in an area where basement dig outs seem to be contrary to uh, the council's local council's development policy and, and generally few and far between we're extremely anxious that the noise and dust produced by the basement dig out will have a negative impact on our son's well-being, both from an effect on their daytime sleep patterns, which they need, and enjoyment of the, the, the outdoor space and the garden. Uh, aside from our amenity, it strikes us that the proposed basement will, will alter the character, will threaten to alter the character and charm of, of the locally listed building, Three Allen Road, and all for the benefit of adding some additional floor space to an already very large property. We welcome the various conditions that Mr. McCulloch has set out in respect to the basement, but would rather see this aspect of the plans rejected outright. Uh, the second um, concern we had was uh, in relation to the proposed new windows facing Five Allen Road. Um, privacy is extremely important to us, and again, choosing to move here from a muse house, which offers limited privacy, was a key factor in selecting the house. The addition of more windows uh, to the room that looks directly into our son's bedroom and, and back garden. Chips One minute away, remaining. Chips away at that privacy. This is a particular concern as the rooms in question already appear to, from the floor pan to, to benefit from large windows. We welcome the conditions regarding obscuring the additional windows uh, and note this will alleviate some of that concern, but we still feel there's a decrease to the overall sense of privacy enjoyed on that side of the house, um, pursuant to these windows being added. And that's all I had to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I have the applicant, Melissa Samuel. Melissa Samuel, are you there? Melissa, uh, could you please unmute your microphone? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Melissa. You, you have three minutes. Uh, you have six minutes. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm Melissa Samuel and my husband and I own and live with our family at 3 Allen Road. We bought the house nearly two years ago and have spent a substantial amount of time working out how best to restore the intrinsically beautiful building, which has sadly been unsympathetically and in many cases crudely altered over the years and turn it into an attractive practical family home. We have followed the council's suggestions in relation to planning applications and the proposal was discussed in detail through a thorough pre-application process with your planning officers, including a meeting on the 20th of March and written advice received on the 1st of April. And we adjusted a number of elements of the proposal to reflect the feedback we received. The revised proposal has been recommended for approval by your planning officers. All relevant planning policies and guidance, in particular on heritage, character and appearance and neighbouring amenity have been satisfied. We considered and took on board each of the objections raised in relation to a development proposed by a former owner of the house in 2017. For example, the proposal in relation to the renovation of the garage and the adjoining outbuildings responds very positively to reasons for refusal of the previous application. Rather than a two-storey brick extension, our proposal raises the existing side wall by about 20 centimetres for the first third and about 60 centimetres for the remaining two thirds. And with the roof sloping away from number one and at a height which obscures our existing windows on the first floor and adds privacy for number one. We have also replaced rather than removed the existing side windows to provide visual interest to this elevation as number one requested. Rather than the approved orangery style rear extension, our proposal addresses the light pollution causes um, concerns raised by neighbours and the solid sidewall improves the privacy for number one. Picking up on some of the points made by previous speakers, I would suggest that each and every one of these has been addressed in full to the satisfaction of your planning officers as set out in the report to their, in the, their report to the committee. In particular, in heritage matters, streetscape and neighbour amenity, concerns have been addressed very carefully and all of your officers are supportive of the proposal. In relation to the side extension, to be clear, the side wall is the only remaining wall of that motorhome and there is no prospect of it being of interest to English heritage in its current state. Sadly, both it and the outbuildings behind it are in a terrible state of repair with leaking roofs and crumbling walls. It is abundantly clear that these buildings need to be rebuilt and we have taken considerable effort and time as well as substantially reducing our original scheme and thoughts to ensure that this proposal has no or minimal impact on our neighbours. This has been borne out by the fact that the daylight and sunlight tests on all of the facing windows at number one are met and exceed all of the BRE criteria as verified by number one's own surveyor's report. There is no impact on the amount of, my, of actual likely natural diffused daylight into these rooms and only a minor impact on the amount of sky which can be seen by standing immediately in front of one window and looking up. This is also consistent with the advice we have received which stated it appears levels of light reaching the neighbour's ground floor side facing TV room, room windows are largely if not entirely determined by the height and bulk of the house. I would expect the proposed changes to the roof of the garage to have a minimal or no impact on light reaching the TV room. The proposal will result in a significant improvement to the streetscape and retain the important gap between the houses. In relation to the rear extension, from a heritage character and appearance perspective, our proposal is a significant improvement, albeit more expensive, on the approved design. The materials we have proposed are more appropriate in the conservation area, and we have narrowed the extension to give more space to the central stair window. This is all met with the approval of your conservation officer. In relation to the basement, we do not see this as an excessive size. It will sit under approximately 20% of the existing house and is cited so as to cause the least impact on our adjacent neighbours. As noted in the report, each of your planning officers the flood officer and the tree officer are completely satisfied with the proposal and the documentation which we have submitted in relation to it. It is fully compliant with planning policies. 
To summarise, our proposal comprehensively addresses the feedback from the pre-application process and the previously refused site extension application. It enhances the character and appearance of the property and the conservation area. One minute remaining. And does not unduly negatively impact our neighbours' amenity, including with respect to daylight and sunlight concerns of our neighbours at number one. It is fully policy compliant and has a clear recommendation for approval by all of your officers. We believe that the result will be a high quality, sensitively designed renovation, which ensures the amenity of our neighbours is preserved and the special building is returned to a well-planned functional family home. Councillors, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 Officer Bryson, uh, do you, would you like to respond, have any comments? Um, just quickly, Chair. Um... We've got a lot of issues raised there. With regard to um, um, the basement aspect of the proposal, yes, it's acknowledged basements do do, and the construction process does cause cause noise. Um, we, in planning terms, we can't object to to the construction process. Um, however, we can impose conditions. Um, in this case, we have imposed uh, fairly standard conditions we do for basements, particularly on domestic properties um, when neighbours are close to each other. Um, so we do have a condition seeking a method of construction statement and controlling hours hours of construction. Um, with regard to the, the side extension, um, is, it is a matter of judgment um, with the proposal. Um, there is a daylight sunlight report which the, 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 the neighbour has, has commissioned, but it does conclude it complies with the BRE um, standards. So it is acknowledged there is there will be some impact, um, but it is to um, side facing ground floor windows. Um, the property is a, a neighbouring property is a large detached property with the majority of the outlook is to the front and rear. Um, so and with along with the design or the roof angling away um, that that um, uh, is how the officers have, have judged that. Um, further I'll draw your attention to the impact on neighbouring amenity section within the committee report um, which the officer has, has set out. Um, With regard to 20, 20, 2017 refusal chair, the scheme is, is materially different and I perhaps can go into a bit, a bit more detail of that should, should the questions arise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Officer Bryson. Uh, so I'll open up to the panel members. Uh, questions, please. Councillor Dean. Uh, yes, um, the, um, the side building, uh, the objector said was 16 metres by six metres. Uh, firstly, is that the case? And secondly, uh, that's materially different from the uh, previous application, isn't it? Thank you, Chair. Bear with me just a second. Uh, yes, Chair, that is correct. Um, with regards to the comparison to the 2017 application, which was refused, um, the depth was the same, and the design was different. So the design was such that the majority of it had a flat roof top to it, which meant there was a, a taller wall um, that would have been facing that neighbouring property. Um, it did have a, a pitch roof at the front as a feature pitch roof, with tile but the majority of it was a flat roof and although the flat, flat roof element was stepped in slightly off the boundary um, that would have resulted in a in a taller wall facing that neighboring property so, so uh, this one's longer isn't it i think uh, it's not it's not longer um it's so the ridge the ridge height for this application the current application is taller than the flat roof element that I just described under the 2017 application. However, the, the top of the ridge would be set further away from the neighbouring boundary because it is a pitch roof. So, so, so is it the same length then? I'm just trying to, it's the same length, isn't it? Yeah. It's same yeah. length, taller and same width. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so all uh, higher capacity than the refused one. You don't no. need to answer that, that's the fact. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dean. Uh, further questions? 
No. Okay. Uh, move on to comments by uh, the panel members, please. Any comments? Councillor Dean? Uh, yeah, well, I think I can't see how, uh, first of all, it's great that um, this uh, um, house is, is being dealt with. Uh, it's a beautiful house, uh, well, potentially beautiful house. Uh, I'm sure everyone will like that. Uh, the, the basement clearly uh, officers have made their opinion known. Um, my argument would be the, the, the side building, I'm calling it a side building, I don't call it a garage, uh, was refused when it was smaller. I can't understand why something that's bigger is now acceptable because um, uh, the planning rules have not changed within that period. So I would ask that that is uh, rejected uh, on that basis because of the uh, bulk massing overlooking uh, and go back to something that's smaller than the previous rejected application. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ward. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as was explained just now by the officer, um, the, the side building is at its peak higher, but um, Councillor Dean said earlier that the capacity um, is definitely bigger. It's not because it's, a, it's now a block with a triangular pitched roof on top of it, where the, the block bit below is, I mean, I have to do the maths to work out exactly whether it's in terms of volume bigger or not. But the, the upshot from it is that the height of the wall, which is on the boundary, is lower than the previous, and it then slopes up towards the middle. So actually, in terms of impact on the neighbours, it's a smaller building whether or not it's actually slightly smaller or not. And uh, I don't think that's a ground for rejection. I think I'd like to congratulate the applicants on the work they've done in working with um, planning officers in pre-application and getting and looking at the rejection in 2017 and taking to, into account neighbours' concerns. We'll never be able to, to, to allay every concern of the neighbours, but I think this is a good proposal and we should, um, um, we should grant permission this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Ward. Uh, any further comments? Uh, Councillor Dean, would you want to make a recommendation? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not hearing anything from anybody else. Uh, if anybody else wants to reject on the bulk and massing of that, uh, then I'd be delighted if nobody is. I think you just need to go to the vote, Chair. Okay. All right, so um, uh, let's go to the vote. All those in favour? Uh, if you could please put your hands up or show your hands. Uh, Ola, could you please okay, count and let me know when you've done that? I've counted seven, Chair. In favour. Those against? In favour. Those against? Uh, that's one. Uh, who was that, sorry? Councillor McGrath. So make it two. No, no, no. Councillor McGrath, I think you said uh, in favour. I'm in favour. Yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, those oh, again. Geez, uh, those again. Okay, and those not voting. Well, at the previous meetings, we've had it by roll call in the end because of this yeah. same problem. I think, yeah, so I think we'll have to go for it. One of the reasons why I'm hesitant against roll call is because we have a very big agenda. Uh, and it could be that we'll be going until about two or three in the morning. Uh, so it looks like we may need to go on a roll call on this. So, uh, uh, Ola, would you be able to call out people's names in terms of for a roll call? Sorry, Chet. Um, if I heard right, there were, I can't remember exactly how many members of this committee, but we had seven in favour. Um, however you do the roll call, that's more than half. No, because I didn't know what Councillor McGrath did, so. Okay, let's go back again. Uh, those in favour, let's start again. Those in favour, could you please put your hands up? Uh, sorry, Councillor McGrath, is your hand up? I can't, okay, yes, that, ma that makes it seven. Okay. Those against? And those not voting. Three. Okay, that's three abstaining. Okay. 
So that's uh, granted. Thank you. Uh, next item, number six, Tooting and Mitchell Football Club, Bishopsford Road. And Councillor Milligan, could you please uh, present the application? Thank you. Uh, could you please uh, unmute yourself? Sorry, I should just start by correcting you there. You called me Councillor Milligan. I'm actually an officer. Oh. Let have made that clear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The application is for the erection of a four to six storey building with 77 shared ownership uh, units, 55 car parking spaces and 168 cycle spaces. Let me just share my screen and then you should be able to see. Can I just confirm you can see the plan? Can I just confirm everyone can see the plan? Yes, I can see. Okay, good, good, thanks. Okay, there's, the report sets out the relative benefits of the proposed scheme, uh, but it also discusses aspects which are not entirely policy compliant. The site is located in a sensible location within a designated metropolitan open land. Planning policy is very clear that there has to be very special circumstances to allow such development in MOL. In this case, the existing community benefit offered by the football club and associated facilities is well recognised. Pages 52 to 56 of the report sets out the numerous community sports that are available at the site. The scheme will enable the provision of 77 shared ownership units, community and sporting benefits to be secured by legal agreement. And these are, there's a new entrance block, sports hall, and that'll have changing rooms, basketball, volleyball, gymnastics and dance. A new changing block with an education facility, and also funds are going to be provided to maintain biodiversity area. Policy DM or one of the adopted sites and policies plan sets out the circumstances under which open space can be developed on. Merton draft plan 2020 identifies the site as being potentially suitable for residential development, subject to very special circumstances through the provision of sporting facilities. The report itself discusses the relative weight that can be accorded to these development policies. Affordable housing is also discussed at paragraph 7.14 and 100% affordable shared ownership um, with potential rent as well could be introduced if grant is secured. And also an, an early and late stage review is recommended to secure any grant funding. Paragraph 7.16 recognises the scheme would add to the housing supply at a time when targets are becoming more challenging. Paragraph 7.28 discusses housing mix. It's recognised that policy is not prescriptive and there's clearly a need for all housing types. So onto paragraph 7.30, we start talking about the design of the building. So if I just pop through the slides now, hopefully. So there we'll see the ground floor of the building. You see the car parking around the main building, which is here, and there's car parking spaces under small undercross. And the car parking spaces have been reduced down to 55, as previously was considered to be uh, detrimental to the visual amenity of the site. Let's get an idea of going up through the floors. This is the first floor, second floor, third floor, at this point in the fourth floor, you'll see that there's a setback here. This is a garden area. And uh, this is closest to Bishop's Bridge Road, which is down this area here. We have a setback and you go up one more floor to the fifth floor. Again, the setback further and further again. You'll see this on the elevations in a minute. So this is the view from Bishop's Bridge Road. So as you can see, the four stories in the foreground, are setting back to five and then six in the background. Again, some views, got Hillfield Avenue on the right hand side there. And this is the view from inside the sports ground. So we've got Bishop's Bridge Road on this side, and then this is the back end of the development here, uh, further into the site. And then some photographs showing um, where well, you can see the main stand there. This is from Polter Park, um, you may be aware of that. Uh, it's, it's actually in Sutton where this photograph is taken from. Again, some of you, these are the houses, Hillfield Avenue, 
next door to the site. So you can see there is a road in between the site and the houses and actually an alleyway between some of the houses there as well at the back. And again, just some photographs giving some context of the, the main site. And it's actually going to be located where the, the hand is there down near the front of the site. Another couple of photographs that are quite useful from Bishop's Bridge Road. You probably recognize that large willow tree in the front of the site. Um, so that will mask the some of the front elevation of the site. I would say there's another photograph coming up. Uh, no, that's the last one, I'm afraid. What I would say is it looks like there's a huge amount of screening there. If you go further down the road, there are definitely gaps through to the site um, as you go further down that particular direction. So in terms of the bulk and the massing, the report recognizing recognizes that the building will be seen. Um, in the local context. However, as I said, there has been, there is some screening from Bishop's Road. Let's go back to the front elevation just to, there we go, just to emphasize that. In terms of design and appearance, paragraph 7.32 recognizes that design and conservation areas, conservation officers are not supportive. However, in their assessments, they're considering a relatively narrow component of the scheme compared to the overall more strategic gains, such as affordable housing delivery and securing sporting facilities for a prominent community facility. The report also recognises that half the units are single aspect. Um, it should recognise this isn't ideal, but is determined by the constricted footprint. Um, the report also states the amenity space within the scheme is policy compliant. Impact on neighbour amenity is considered to be adequate in this case due to separation distances. So officers consider that on balance, given the significant sporting and community track record already established at the club and the further facilities that are to be provided, approval can be recommended in this particular case. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, thank you, uh, Officer Milligan. And who knows, you'll make an excellent counsellor in the future. So, <laughs> uh, Right. Um, the first speaker I have on my list is Tony Burton. Uh, Tony, are you are you there? Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, Tony. Thank you very much. You have three minutes. Hi, I'm Tony Burton. I'm Secretary of Mitcham Cricket Green Community and Heritage, the civic society for this part of Mitcham. Your decision on this application should be the easiest of the evening. Indeed, it is perhaps the easiest we have been involved with in the last decade or more. Imperial Fields is one of the most protected sites in the whole of Merton. It is located in the Wandle Valley Regional Park and designated as protected open space, as green corridor, and critically as metropolitan open land. The development also impacts the Wandle Valley Conservation Area. Metropolitan open land is Merton's Greenbelt, at the pinnacle of planning protection, where inappropriate development is only allowed in very special circumstances. Even the applicant recognises its scheme qualifies as inappropriate development. And while we welcome the community offer provided by the hub, on closer inspection, the plans fall well short of meeting the very special circumstances test. This is not a charitable endeavour. Contrary to claims that we are not a commercial company, the applicant, Tooting and Mitcham Leisure Limited, is a private company limited by shares, controlled by and dependent on a £1 million plus loan from a property developer. It is also apparent that the new development could generate funds for only a small part of the investment needed at the hub. A reception area, small sports hall and some changing rooms do not amount to transformational change. Even the affordable housing offer doesn't meet Merton's policy requirement for a mix of different types of affordable homes. Shockingly, around half of the homes are single aspect. This is a design issue and not an issue about the site's constraints. And for the avoidance of doubt, we should also suspend disbelief for a moment and consider the development as if it qualified as an exception to metropolitan open land protection. Even if this fantasy were true, the development would still be a third rate design, intrude on the conservation area as well as the open space, and create a large area of surface car parking in what is currently green space. It is no surprise, therefore, that your own urban design officer castigates the plans as nothing more than, quote, an office block in a car park, and your conservation officer disagrees with the plan and describes it as, quote, a massive development adjacent to conservation area, open land and a nature reserve. Sutton Council, CPRE London, Wandle Valley Forum and the neighbouring MP are united in their objections. The applicants didn't even dare expose their scheme to the design review panel. 
Even Sport England has raised doubts about whether people can live in flats so close to a sports stadium. Its assessment indicates a clear risk the development will result in a noise abatement order that reduces playing capacity on the pitch. Sport England's acoustic assessment confirms that the residential balconies could not be used at the same time as the adjacent sports facilities. We're sure you don't want Mayor Khan to be intervening in another development. This is the clearest possible conflict with your planning policies. Your decision is an unusually easy one. Please turn down this planning application. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Burton. Uh, my next speaker I have is Dr. Oskrochi. Um, are you there? Hello, Chair. Yeah, my name is Dr. Yusuf Skrochi. I'm a public health specialist, uh, and I'm also a resident of Bishop's House Resident Association who live across in Polter Park, and we are neighbours of this development. Firstly, the developer has not demonstrated that their proposal satisfies the very special circumstances required for the development on metropolitan open land. The premise of their argument is the fact that the draft local plan suggests suitability for residential development by the provision of sporting facilities. And it was also used by Mr. Milligan in its justification, given their extensive track record. This premise is weak, however, given it's based on an unratified document at best and wholly inadequate if you consider that the current sporting facilities are underutilized. Thus, additional sporting capacity and provision is not currently demanded, hence its future potential value is severely limited. The majority of internal external stakeholders consulted in the process of the report also refer to this fact and the fact that post provisions which the developer has promised to provide would not outweigh the costs. On the topic of the report, it's remarkable that although the majority of stakeholders consulted appear to object to development, the overall recommendation is to approve. And I understand this is not based on a popular vote, but the weight of negative sentiment, including from the GLA and local stakeholders, needs to be taken into account. For example, that building is going to be very obvious from the park, which a lot of people use for their recreation abilities. Secondly, it's a sensitive site from both an ecological and environmental perspective. Any development on the site needs to be with a trustworthy and reliable partner who is ready to compromise and work with local residents and the council. Having been neighbours with Imperial Fields for the last 13 years, we have documented evidence of where we have promises of development on our shared border in the form of soundproofing and planting of trees, which were removed by the landowner, which have never been fulfilled despite repeated requests. Your own officers highlight the fact that the developer misrepresented the GLA in their application, stating erroneously that the GLA supported this application, even when they merely said the progress had been made, but they still had reservations. This all demonstrates the modus operandi of a landowner who is not a reliable or trustworthy partner. I know to many One supportive or neutral stakeholders, including your own officers, qualify their stance by requesting further explanations and clarifications from the developer. Some of which, such as the climate change officer, have not been forthcoming since March. This does not bode well for a sensitive site. As Tony Burton has mentioned, this site is already well protected and this should, well be, this should be the easiest decision you make this evening. I would urge the council members to reject this proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oxerochi. Um, I have two uh, agents, Nigel Bennett and Jackie Watkins. Uh, are you both there? I can yes, see hello. hello, Chairman. Are you sharing or are you, will it just be the one of you speaking? Uh, yes, we'd like to uh, share, Chairman, please. Okay, that's fine. You have uh, six minutes between the two of you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the committee. We have worked hard with your planning department for a long time, so, so we're very pleased to have reached this stage with a clear and positive recommendation. Yes, it's currently MOL, just as the stadium is, but this is a site that is identified for enabling residential development in the council's emerging local plan and has been for a long time now. In fact, the number of positive responses from local people on the plan's two previous consultations show that it is one of the most supported local plan sites, if not the most supported site in the whole of the borough. We are pleased that officers are now attaching proper weight to this. There is of course a balance to make, there always is with planning cases, but we don't agree that it's a finely balanced one. Given the two new community buildings that will be delivered and the 100% affordable housing scheme, or in the context of the emerging site allocation, the benefits versus harm assessment, in our opinion, is overwhelmingly in favour of granting planning permission. Members will be aware there are now two separate viability reports, one from our own consultant, ULL, one from the council's consultants, Altair, both of which demonstrate that the community benefits can be viably delivered. The affordable housing office offer 
from the outset has been guided by discussions with senior officers, registered providers and the GLA, who are indeed wholeheartedly in support of the application, despite what the last objector said, and have provided helpful guidance on the draft 106. This will include robust legal safeguards to ensure delivery. The availability of grant funding will go specifically towards the provision of affordable rented accommodation once a registered housing provider formally takes on the delivery of the scheme, allowing the split between shared ownership and affordable rent to be flexible. We note that Altair consider that three affordable rented units should be the baseline position, rising to 21 units upon grant funding. The applicant wants to make it very clear to the councillors that he is happy with Altair's position. It aligns with his own aspiration to provide as much affordable rented accommodation as possible. The ability to review the final housing tenure mix will be secured by the Section 106 agreement, as stipulated by the GLA, and is a fully policy compliant approach. During the course of the whole process, we have listened carefully to the concerns raised by various parties. Wherever it has been possible, we have made changes, such as a reduction in car parking by over 20 spaces, allowing an increased amount of green spaces around the building to include enhanced landscaping and play space, which has significantly increased the quality of the scheme. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to hand over to Jackie now to say a few words. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Councillors. Um, I run the site Imperial Fields and um, over the last few months, obviously, our views on what is normal and how the future will look has changed immensely. One thing sticks out more than anything is that we are social animals and need the company of others. People that attend our site do so for a number of reasons, but mainly to feel they belong and meet others in a safe and secure environment. As a business, we need sustainability to be able to enhance our delivery and continue what we do, which has become more necessary than ever since lockdown. For me, the decision is an easy one. Do we keep a small piece of land that has not been used for many years and unlikely to be in the future, or do we provide much needed affordable housing and additional meeting, education and sporting facilities? During the lockdown, when the site was not protected through us being there, the whole area saw an increase in antisocial behaviour, vandalism and fly tipping. The police were amazing during this time and did everything they could to help us. But this is what happens when land is just left. We protect the site as being visible to those who want to destroy it. We need to be realistic in these uncertain times and need to supply what is required by the majority of people who need interaction and sociable exercise for their health and well-being. More people would benefit from our proposal than do at the moment from this piece of unused land. Please, plus the enhanced landscaping would see the area around it be more accessible to those who want to use it. Without sustainability, will we be able to survive? Well, that's the million dollar question at the moment. Nobody knows. We only know what we have when it is not there and then it is too late. We could lose 120 young people in education, 4,000 visits to the site a week, local clubs training and playing matches, ethnic groups celebrating their culture through numerous events, training and upskilling for all, which is needed more than ever at the moment, delivering awareness campaigns, mental health assistance, fitness, soft play for children. One minute left. Disability groups meeting and training, protecting the biodiversity on the site by ensuring no vandalism and fly tipping. To be honest, the use of the site at the moment is endless. So do we lose all this or give housing to people who desperately need it in the borough? Do we increase our delivery to young people via sport and education, as at the moment demand outweighs the places we can provide? Do we expand to include dance and drama, constantly asked for, do we deliver and English and other language classes to those who need it? Do we expand our sports range to give indoor as well as outdoor delivery? Do we enhance our, disab our disability, Six minutes. which is impossible at the present? So tonight, the decision is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Jackie and uh, Nigel. Uh, Officer Milligan, would you, do you have any comments and would you like to respond? 
Only on one issue, um, one of the objectors raised the issue of the state as the ownership of the site, and as you're aware, as members, ownership is not a material planning consideration when deciding applications. Uh, thank you, Officer Milligan. Uh, I'm now going to open up to the panel members for questions. Officer Southgate. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um... Very special circumstance. Is that entirely down to our judgment? Are there any, uh, you know, precedents in appeal verdicts that you can cite to enable us to understand that and how precisely uh, it, it can be used? Um, yes, there's lots of appeals, uh, no doubt, about MOL and very special circumstances, um, but each one of them will be unique. That's the uh, interesting thing about planning, each site is always different. So there are always different circumstances. The report sets out what those uh, special circumstances are on this particular site, and it sets out what the policy says. So then it is a judgment for councillors to determine whether those circumstances have met that bar. Uh, thank you. Councillor Lanning? Thank you, Chair. I've got two questions. Um, the first is around the um, provision of affordable housing. I know that there's the early and late stage viability um, that's conditioned. So is there a chance that actually we wouldn't see 100% affordable if there was late stage viability and it was actually seen as unviable? And the second question is just to sort of summarise the overcoming of the very special circumstances. In essence, is it that because we've got this 100% affordable, plus the provision of sporting facilities, that's where we're seeing that it can overcome the very special circumstances. Or are there other things that enable us to meet that test? You. Take your second question first, in terms of the special circumstances. Um, yes, as I said, it is a judgment for yourselves um, in terms of what, what that might be. Obviously, the report does set out um, that there are shortcomings in the scheme as well. And it doesn't shy away from that. It says it up front. So you have to balance those shortcomings versus the benefits. And the report sets out what those benefits are. And you're absolutely right. That is the sporting facilities, the affordable housing, and providing residential units. They are clearly benefits. Um, in terms of the housing um, viability and whether it's 100% affordable, the recommendation is that there would be a, an early stage and a late stage review of viability. No one knows where the world will be in a year's time when this is potentially built or in two years time when it's potentially started. So it's, it's impossible to say at this moment, but that's the point of having those viabilities review is that they can capture that at a, a later date. I think, uh, Councillor Makin. Thank you. I've got a number of questions uh, to the officers. Um, what what, what um, support can you can you give us that they're going to maintain the trees and the uh, properties because according to your report they didn't previously uh, the second one is other tall buildings in the area where where exactly are they and um have the police been involved have the police commented on this application thank you um my understanding the police have um i can't Quite a large report. I can't look at it this very, very minute, but I'm sure I might be able to before the end of the uh, the item is done. But um, it's certainly in there somewhere. So they have commented. Um, taking your other issues, the the tall buildings that are mentioned. Um, I went and had a look on site. I had I I agree the the tallest buildings in the immediate context of the site are four stories, and this is obviously larger set back in the site at six stories. Um, if you go down further down Bishop Bishopsbury Road. Um, towards the fire station, towards Mitcham, there are higher buildings there, but I, I do agree they are not immediately in the vicinity of the site. In terms of trees, um, this site, <coughs> I, can, oh, I won't bother sharing the scheme at the moment because it is, if you remember the site plan, the, um, the actual line around this site is actually quite small, it's not around the whole site, it's just a specific part of the Tooting Mitcham plan, so it doesn't actually necessarily impact on the rest of the site as a whole, so this would be specific to this. In terms of the previous permissions, there are conditions, etc., attached to those um, permissions which require maintenance and introduction of trees. So if there are any issues on removal of existing trees or destruction of them, they can be looked at on an individual basis if necessary. Thank you. Councillor Christie. Yeah. 
Sorry, if I can just respond to Councillor Makin's question about the Metropolitan Police. Uh, if, members turn to page, if members turn to page 74 of the agenda, at the foot of page 74 is the um, Metropolitan Police Safe by Design Officer comments. Um, uh, there are a number of bullet points there if Councillor Makin wants to wants to turn to that. Thank you. I missed that on the phone. Page 74. Thank you. Uh, Bottom of page 74. Right. Uh, item 5.2.1. Uh, Councillor Makin. Right, Councillor Christie. Yeah, let's move on to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have three questions. Um, firstly, I, I don't know if it's in here or if the officers can uh, provide it. The, uh, I couldn't say anything about the, uh, the GIA, the internal uh, sort of space standards. Um, it, uh, did I miss it, or is there anything you can you can tell me to say that the the, the units would meet the minimum standards? Um, secondly, on on single aspect, um, again, I, I don't know if I, if I've missed it, but could you tell me how many of the the units would be single aspect? And finally, on on the affordable housing, um, I, I I may have misunderstood. My understanding was that the, the proposal was for 100% shared ownership, but it sounded like in the presentation and in uh, the comments of one of the um, uh, the applicants uh, that there was potential that there would be at least three and potentially more uh, social rented units. Could you just sort of clarify what the situation is with the affordable uh, provision? Thank you. Let's take the affordable first. Um, the, the viability review, the independent one that was um, commissioned by the council, demonstrates that of the 100% the uh, shared units, there could actually be three affordable rents. And the reason for that was the uh, consultants looked at the cost of the sports block and decided that the cost that were put in for that as part of the viability was, was too high effectively, so that money could be then transferred over. And as you heard, the applicants in their introduction before, they're happy to accept that. The other aspect of this is, although it's speculative, um, there could well be a grant associated with this scheme in the future. And if that is secured, then it goes back up. And it was going to be 17 affordable rent units, uh, but because of the additional three that's just been mentioned, it would actually up, up be up to 20. Um, so that would be improving the offer there. But again, I would emphasize that is subject to grant. Now, when you have a scheme like this, um, our experience is they, do tend to get grants if they're actually built out. So there's a great, a good possibility of that. Single aspect, um, the report says half the units. I asked a very similar question of the case officer actually this afternoon. I had just the exact well, number. The it, Sorry? I do have the figures there if you want. Um, for 47 of the 77 units would be single aspect, of which 25 face north. How many, sorry? For 47 of the 77, a single All aspect. Right and 25 of those face to the north. Okay, thank you. So you've heard that now. So it's, it's over half the units with a single aspect. Um, in terms of the GIA, um, I do believe the report says that it does comply with the internal standards, but I'm sure, Lee, if that's not the case, can let us yeah, know now. That is correct, yeah. Yes, that is correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dehaney, uh, could you unmute your microphone, please? Oh. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yes. Good. Here is the first one here on the energy efficiency of the building, which uh, according to the developer is difficult to achieve. Have you got any comment on that? Yes, there, there is a, a small outstanding element of that, in terms, certainly in terms of um, overheating of the building. And there is a, a condition, and it's actually a, something we don't often do these days, a pre-commencement condition, which requires that that particular matter is sorted out through the consultants before the, uh, the site is actually built. So yes, it can, it, it can technically be achieved, I'm sure, but they'll have to revisit the building and, and make sure that does actually occur. Thank you. Any further questions before I move on to comments? Okay, comments, please. No comments? Right, I shall move on. Oh, Councillor, <laughs> Councillor Ward, please. Uh, any comments, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I think it's interesting that the um, 
<clears throat> one of the um, objectors to the application said this was the easiest possible decision we could make. Um, the applicant said that it was overwhelmingly in favor, therefore the opposite way, that it was one of the easiest decisions we should make in favor. And the officers are saying um, that this is a, sort of a borderline judgment in terms of councillors um, and members of this panel's um, this, this committee's judgment as to whether we, we go yes or no. So there's obviously some hyperbole on both sides in favour and against saying this is absolutely clear cut one way or the other. It's very clear that this is a marginal decision and there's a number of issues we have to um, look at. I'm, and it is, it is a marginal and a difficult decision for us here. But as is, is always the case, on this committee, I don't. I'm. I'm not going to just not vote because I can't make my way. My mind up one way or the other. It's going to be a marginal decision one way or the other. Um, I was hoping for more comments from other councillors to see what people um, thought on this. But my just judgment is to just about say because of the the benefits outlined that we should just about go in favour of this application. I'd like to propose um, that. Well, that's already proposed as the officer's proposal anyway. So um, yes, if nobody else wants to comment, please move to the vote. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Ward. Councillor Southgate, please. Uh, could you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm still, I, I still find this uh, matter of a very special circumstance really opaque. We've, we've got a um, an impressive, um, presentation of, of all that the, the hub have done over the years and I've been there many times and I've, um, you know, it's a range of, of really useful work done reaching uh, all many groups in in, in in our in our borough um, and yet I remain unconvinced that, that amounts to a, a very special circumstances that is sufficient to to pivot this decision in in favour. Um, if I look at the, uh, if if we move from that to say, well, okay, let's just look at this. Uh, you know, let's put that trade off to one side for the moment. And, and you'll note that the GLA are, are far from convinced that, that there is a very special circumstance. And look at the actual um, proposal. We have a a six-story block, which is is admittedly high for the area. We have um, the proposal is shared ownership, which is affordable housing, but not as we know it, Jim. It's um, uh, the the evidence is that the majority of the people who live in Mitcham could not, in fact, afford to buy into to this. Uh, the mix you will notice also is uh, predominantly one and two bedrooms. Sorry, I'm, I'm running from memory, but I'm pretty sure I'm right there. It doesn't accord with our desired one third, one third, one third distribution between one, two and three bedrooms. We've been told that 47 of the units, more than half, are um, single aspect, uh, which, which Again, it's not not attractive by any means. So, I think just looked at on its own merits, um, there is a lot wrong with 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 this building, and I would not uh, really not want to see it. Uh, those shortcomings are excused because of the the proposed benefits in the, uh, the sporting facilities. So, I would I would not be keen to support it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Southgate. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Chair. And um, just want to say I've listened to what everyone had said. I've listened to the objection, uh, objectors and also want to you know, bring everyone's attention and the feelings to the amount of people we have homeless in our borough, the amount of children who attend school without having a proper night's sleep because there may be six or seven of our young people living in one bedroom with their family. This um, application, it may appear a bit impartial in many ways. It may appear that we're taking up green spaces, but what we need to understand that most of us sitting down here tonight, we live in a home, we have somewhere to live. We want to think about the people, the children who haven't got anywhere to live. 
You know, many times I walk in my ward in Palo Alto, I visit homes, seven family live in one bedroom. Can we please pass this application so some homeless children can get somewhere to live? I mean, it may look very expensive, but of course there's support out there for everyone. I would like to this application to be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Lanning. Thank you, Chair. And Councillor Henry's, to, just to Councillor Henry's point, I think if this was socially rented, my view on, like 100% socially rented, my view on this application would be very different. But I think the, the reality of the application that's in front of us is that the shared ownership would only be affordable to those who earn at least £50,000 per year. So the reality for those who will be able to afford to live in these properties will unfortunately not be the homeless in our borough. And I think the point that actually it doesn't meet the test around very special circumstances, the, the points that Councillor Southgate outlined, I entirely agree with. And notwithstanding that, the fact that if we were to um, look at it just on its own merits as, a, as an application elsewhere, without the sort of um, affordable uh, provision, I don't think we would accept, and I don't think we've recently accepted some, an application which had fewer than um, the sort of 50% single aspect because that goes against our policy. So all in all, I, wouldn't, I won't be able to support this application. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move on to the vote, uh, please. So those in, those in, sorry, Council Ward, did you have a final comment before I move on? Yes, sir, can I have a final comment? I think running through the support application is a thought that we are allowing residential property to be built on metropolitan open land. I think that's a theme running through the whole thing. And most people don't know why this is being done. What is so special about this development that we are going to allow the use of metropolitan open land for residential purposes? And I think that has not been satisfactorily explained. Doesn't mean I won't vote for it, but you know, we are using this affordable housing idea to pass a lot of developments which we wouldn't normally do and I do think we need to be careful about that you know because this MOT metropolitan open land should not be used for residential purposes. Uh, thank you Councillor Dehaney. Uh, Councillor Ward uh, if you have any comments it'll be the final comment. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? I prematurely put my hand up to vote. Oh, right, okay, sorry. <laughs> right, so I'd like to move on to the vote, please. Uh, so clearly, if you could put your hands up. Uh, those in favour? That appears to be one chair. Uh, sorry, Anna, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Sorry. What's that? One in favour, chair? Oh, sorry, two. No, 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 no. I, Oh. I, I do think it may be best to go for a roll call. Yeah, I think we'll go for a roll call of this one. So, uh, if you could please do uh, do the roll call. Okay. Um, Councillor Christie, for, against, or abstain? For. Councillor Dean. For, against, or abstain? Abstain, abstain. Councillor Dehaney, for, against, or abstain? For. John, said it's wrong. Councillor Henry, for, against, or abstain? For. Councillor Lanning, for, against, or abstain? Against. Councillor Makin, for, against, or abstain? Unmute, Russell. Unmute. Councillor Makin? Councillor Makin, could you unmute yourself, please? 
Uh, not voting. Okay, absent. Councillor McGrath, for, against, or abstain? For. Councillor Southgate, for, against, or abstain? Against. Councillor Ward, for, against, or abstain? For. And Councillor Latif, for, against, or abstain? I'll abstain. Mm. Okay, that's... Yeah, terrible. That's what we see. Rebecca and I. One, two. One, two. One, two. Okay, that's um, five against. No. no. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Four, five, five in favour. Beg your pardon. Five in favour, two against, and three abstentions. Okay, so that's fine. That's so been, it has been granted. Thank that's you. Sorry, Chair. Chair. So, so I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. Um, so far as I'm aware that the scheme now needs to be referred under the stage two to the Mayor of London. So yes. this evening. Um, the council has passed a resolution um, which will form the basis of the second stage uh, referral and it will be open now depending on whether the, the mayor wants to call the case in or not. Uh, thank you. So, so, sorry, to, sorry to butt in, but no, just, no, just... Thank you very much, that's, that's okay. well noted. Thank you. Right, uh, moving on to item seven, 159 Common Side East, and uh, Officer Lewis, uh, grateful if you could do the presentation. Can I just confirm that people can see the um, see the screen? Uh, uh, sorry, Officer Lewis, we can only see the Zoom screen. We can't see any of the plans or the... Let's try okay. again. It's okay. Sorry, won't keep you a second. Can you see the drawings now? Uh, still, yep, yes, you're all good to go now. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could just draw members' attention to uh, the modifications um, sheet for this particular um, item. I think it's quite useful in the sense that some, uh, some members may recall this application, uh, sorry, this um, site uh, application came before members uh, just over a year ago to redevelop um, the site, which used to be a, a scrap yard um, with a uh, single dwelling on it to provide um, a, a number of flats. Um, members at the time uh, chose to go against the officer's recommendation. Uh, the application was the subject of uh, an appeal. Uh, the appeal was um, dismissed. Uh, the applicant, so the owner of the site has come back with uh, a revised set of proposals. Um, which um, comprise uh, a reduced number of, uh, of dwellings. Um, uh, there's a reduction in the bulk of the building at um, top floor. Uh, 
level. If I can just um, hold on that um, uh, image there, the previous scheme had where the arrow is tracing the building went out um, further um, at um, top floor level. Um, again, keeping your eye on the um, uh, modification sheet, you'll see that um, the, um, uh, the building has, um, or th sorry, the, the proposals um, have um, been reduced in height by um, around a metre um, at second floor parapet level um, by uh, 0.6 um, of uh, a metre. Um, one of the key um, things which um, has been um, altered on this um, scheme is that all the units um, now are dual um, aspect and all have external spaces uh, to meet uh, adopted standards. Um, members may recall, and I'll just scroll down to um, some of the, the street views of uh, the site. Since the, um, uh, the last application was considered, um, the council has introduced uh, a controlled parking scheme uh, locally, thereby enabling um, residents um, to um, have the opportunity to park in Hallowell Close. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's introduced double yellow lines um, all along uh, the west side um, of uh, uh, Hallowell um, Close. So if I can sort of turn members back to the, um, uh, the last um, scheme, the key concerns there were uh, bulk massing, um, single aspect units and um, uh, impact uh, on parking in the area. And officers um, consider that uh, the revised scheme, which as I've said, reduces uh, the bulk um, of uh, the building at top floor level, uh, now has the benefit uh, of the controlled parking scheme uh, in the area. And if I can take you quickly to the, to the floor plans, As you can see, um, units, windows, front and back, windows, front and back. And again, with all these units uh, as well, um, windows and front and back. So we have a scheme which, although the, um, the detailing um, and uh, overall sort of design approach uh, is still overtly modern, um, officers feel that the proposals now overcome the earlier concerns uh, of members and the scheme is worthy of support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Officer Lewis. Uh, first speaker I have on my list is Tony Burton. Uh, Tony, are you, have you joined us again? Could you unmute your uh, microphone, please? Hello there, I'm back. Yep, Tony, so, you've got three minutes. Thank you. Tony Burton, I'm Secretary of Mitcham Cricket Green Community in Heritage, which is the Civic Society for this part of Mitcham. If I may say first, please will councillors who say they don't like planning applications stop voting in favour of them, as has just happened on Imperial Fields. You risk losing all public credibility. The former Sparrowhawk Yard is a classic brownfield site. We all know it will benefit from development, and we put it forward for new housing as part of the local plan review. This is an opportunity to deliver an exemplary development by the conservation area and facing Three Kings Peace. It demands the highest standards and we applaud you for rejecting an earlier inadequate scheme in 2018. The wisdom of your decision was upheld on appeal. Regrettably, too little has changed since those plans were rejected. The scheme is only marginally smaller and suffers from many of the same design flaws. Critically, there is still a flat roof above the ridge line of the neighbouring 145 Common Side East, and it still overshadows and dominates the modest 1930s dwellings in Hallowell Close. These are both grounds on which the appeal was dismissed. The walked logic in the officer's report that the plans meet the policy requirement for development to be in keeping with local character because more flats are being permitted 
in areas of terraced family homes should not delay the committee for more than a moment. The building also intrudes on Three Kings Peace, which the applicant persists in confusing with Mitcham Common. You have not been provided by the applicant with the visual information you need to make an informed judgment on this critical impact on the conservation area. There are other design flaws, including the poor quality blank frontage that will be a prominent feature in the view of everyone moving along Common Side East. The scheme is also based on parking assumptions that include the illegal fly parking on registered town green alongside Common Side East. This illegal parking needs to be stopped and not validated through a misguided planning application. The scheme pleads poverty in not providing any affordable homes, despite being well above the size threshold. One minute left. Close analysis of the viability assessment shows this is more down to the developer paying too much for the land. And the assessment also admits that it is, it is quote, not in accordance with red book standards and should not be relied upon for valuation. You should therefore not rely on it when making your decision. The proposals are in conflict with national and local planning policy. They do not address the grounds on which a similar scheme was turned down on appeal. We ask you to reject them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony. Next speaker, I have Michael Forward. Uh, Michael, are you with us? I am, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, you have three minutes. I live at number two Hallowell Close, which faces over this new development. Um, I speak on behalf of myself and also those of Hallowell Close and Common Side East. Um, I would also like to point out that prior to this meeting, um, members of our streets did not receive any adequate warning for this meeting, but luckily we have a good community here in place that we could speak among ourselves and highlight the fact that this meeting was happening. Um, following on that, I would like to object to this planning uh, application based on some following points. The height of this building is much too large for our area. As you can see from the photos that you saw earlier, we are all two-story houses with pitched roofs. This states to have a four-story building in that place, taking away from our light. Following on from that, there is also balconies on the level three, which would face straight into our bedroom windows. This would take away our privacy. I follow on from Tony to say that design consideration needs to be made regarding some of these elements. Two of these areas, one being the corner of Hallowell Close and Common Side East is a very blank brick wall. This would be shown just as a slab, almost like a climbing wall. Other than that, there's also the lift shaft, which there has been no design intent to bring any beauty to the building, and it just sticks out like a sore thumb. Following on from Tony as well with the parking, living on this street, we've had difficulty parking for a long time. The one photo that I've just seen then shows two spaces outside of my house, but that rarely occurs ever. Normally there's too many parking and residents have to park in other streets in the neighboring area. And with the elderly uh, people on our streets, that becomes very hard trying to find a space in their own home. I'd also like to state that in previous planning applications, as you can see from the image on the screen, there is now four entrances into the properties on Hallowell Close. Previously in meetings, it was discussed that there should be more entrances coming out onto Hallowell Close. And previously there were six and more entrances also going on to Common Side East. As I said earlier about the community on the street, we feel that this is needed because we want to know the people that move into these areas, not people that just turn up into their flats and don't want to be part of the community. As you can see also, there is a large balcony at the top and there'll be massings of people on there and we don't want to be disturbed with large parties happening on this balcony either. With this, I would like you to please reject this application. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, uh, Officer Lewis, would you be able to stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, I have Samutri Patel as the agent. Uh, Mr. Patel, are, are you with us? Yeah. Good. Good uh, evening, councillors. <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Patel, uh, you have six minutes. Thank you. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. 
This development offers an excellent opportunity to provide 25 high quality homes on a brownfield, sustainably located site close to Mitcham Eastfield Station and the district centre. A previous application on the site was refused. The revised application has been developed following, enga following engagement with stakeholders and your officers to successfully overcome the reasons for refusal. In the words of the design review panel, the proposal is a carefully thought through and well considered scheme, which responds well to the two different streets. Compared to the refused proposals, the massing has been reduced to better relate to the existing character. The single mass previously proposed has been split into two buildings linked by a core, thus reducing the footprint. The roof form has been reshaped and the third floor reduced by 18%. It is set back four to 4.5 metres from the Hallowell Close frontage. Elsewhere, eaves and parapet heights have also been reduced. A view across Three Kings Peace has been provided to officers following receipt of the objections um, from the Mitcham Green Conservation Group. And this clearly demonstrates that the proposals will not have an adverse impact on the setting of the conservation area. High quality architecture is proposed, which will enhance the character of the area and will not cause harm to the neighbouring amenity or the environment, including the adjacent conservation area. This has been robustly tested by your officers and at Design Review Panel, who gave a green score. The scheme will deliver spacious residential accommodation, which exceeds minimum space standards. All units will have a dual aspect and there is a mix of unit sizes. Private external space has been maximised with all homes meeting and exceeding minimum standards. A communal terrace is proposed and this is 20 metres away from the properties on Hallowell Close. We have noted to officers that if members consider it necessary, we can provide details of how planting can be provided on the edge of the terrace to ensure that residents are not looking over the edge towards the properties on Hallowell Close. However, as noted, they are 20 metres away Therefore, there is not considered to be any privacy issues in this regard. 17 car parking spaces are proposed in line with the parking ratio found acceptable by the planning inspector and future residents will not be allowed to apply for parking permits. Land in front of Hallowell Close is also being provided for, for highways improvements. An affordable housing contribution of almost £67,000 will be made and a review mechanism put in place so that this can be increased if the scheme's viability improves. In total, Section 106 and SEAL contributions will amount to circa £417,000. To conclude, a sustainable development is proposed which will deliver 25 much needed high quality homes. Since the appeal, the new London plan has advanced to carry significant weight and this has increased housing targets. The new London plan specifically expects brownfield and small sites such as this located close to stations and town centres to fulfil an important role in the incremental intensification of existing residential areas to help to meet the significantly increased housing targets that London and Merton needs. The London plan requires boroughs to provide proactive support for well-designed new homes on small sites and to recognise that local character evolves over time and that character will change to accommodate the additional housing that is needed. In this case, the scheme has been well-designed as supported by your officers in their report and by the design review panel who unanimously praised the design. Finally, the proposal complies with the development plan, the new London plan and the NPPF. The proposals also satisfactorily overcome the previous reasons for refusal as confirmed by your officer's report. We therefore respectfully ask that you grant planning permission. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Patel. Right, uh, I'd like to open up to the panel. Oh, sorry, uh, Officer Lewis, would you like to respond or do you have any comments before I open up to the panel members? Um, if I could just direct members to page 147 of the agenda um, paper, um, the design review panel, um, the proposals or the draft proposals did receive a green verdict. The panel were unanimous in their praise for the appearance and architecture of the proposed design. Uh, panel also liked the proposed materials, um, and the dual aspect nature of the flats um, was praised. Um, I could just simply confirm that circumstances have changed since the last scheme. The CPZ has been introduced, um, thereby addressing um, early concerns raised by members. But I respect the fact that ultimately it is a matter of judgment if members remain uncomfortable with the design, appearance and massing of the building. Uh, thank you, Officer Lewis. 
I'd like to open up to the panel members for questions, please. Mm. Councillor McGraw. Could you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Sorry, no, I, I didn't mean I had a question. All oh, right, <laughs> Councillor Southgate. Um, thank you, Chair. The report gives the impression of a bit of a standoff between the developer and the, uh, the council, really, on the allocation of and paying for parking bays in front of the development. Um, am I correct, my understanding of the, the modification sheet, and indeed what has just been said by the um, by Ms Patel, that that has now been resolved? So... Can we put that aside as a, a, a concern? Um, Chair, um, the members may recall that if I can, could I, could I please share the, um, the, the screen with you uh, yeah, please, please a do. moment? The, the earlier um, proposals when we didn't have the CPZ, um, were designed so as to provide not dedicated parking spaces, but some supplementary spaces um, in front of the building uh, along um, Hallowell Close. Now these are outside the application site, but the design is such that the footpath could have been taken around the back of the parking spaces um, and then turn uh, the corner. Um, the uh, council, um, uh, would, have, would I think have, have, have uh, welcomed perhaps um, that arrangement, but um, the applicant knows full well that if we were to press that um, particular point, there has to be a sound um, planning reason for securing those bays um, as part of, uh, of any development. And the long and short of it is the parking arrangement to the rear of the scheme provides sufficient parking for the um, uh, development. The Section 106 agreement would prevent residents from having parking uh, permits, so they wouldn't add to parking pressure um, in the street. And whilst um, the council could enter into an agreement with uh, the applicant um, to um, perhaps um, provide um, additional land in front of uh, the development to widen uh, the footpath at, at street level, so that's in this area here, the scheme doesn't uh, fall or succeed um, on that particular um, issue. So I, I would say, you know, it, it has a neutral impact on the outcome of the scheme. It may be welcome to have that space, um, but if the applicant um, is unable to um, assist with um, funding that it would be unreasonable for the council to withhold permission on something which, as I said, the scheme doesn't turn um, on that particular um, issue anymore. Thank you. Officer. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Dean. Uh, yes, I, I'm slightly confused now. Um, are there, at the moment, there's um, on street uh, parking. Sorry, it's just a very large spider coming my way. Very big. Um, the um, on-street parking is on pavement parking at the moment. Are we saying that the pavement is going to be moved and there will be um, on-road parking there? Is that what's being offered? Um, Chair, um, since the uh, earlier scheme was considered, um, the parking arrangements have changed um, along Hallowell Close. At the time of um, considering the last application, um, parking in the street was supplemented by the um, provision of half on half on um, uh, spaces along the east side, sorry, the west side of Hallowell um, Close. That's now been changed. Double yellow lines have been introduced, thereby preventing any parking along that side of the road. But to counter that, the street has now been made part of a controlled parking zone, so any development on this site can be regulated in such a way as to ensure that no overspill parking would harm the amenities of neighbouring residents. So I understand that. I heard that before. I'm just trying to be clear. 
is this um, is this new parking bays being put there on the road or not? Just yes or no on that. I just need because on the plan there, I see six parking bays. No, the the, um, the plan shows those those bays, but as I said, that was something that could be negotiated with the developer. The developer um, feels unable to um, pay for the costs of those um, bays because it's not something that the council could actually refuse. So, so, so they shouldn't be on the plan. That's what we're saying. At Correct. Moment, yeah. Correct. I needed to understand. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. I'd like to move on to comments, please, by the any panel members. <laughs> right. Uh, in that case, can we please move on to the vote? Those in favour? Uh, that looks like seven, Chair. Thank you. Put your hands down, please. Uh, those against? Sorry, Councillor Henry, was your hand up for four or against? Could you unmute yourself, please, Councillor Henry? I, my hand was up and you can't seven. Not, it's not seven, it's eight. It is, yeah. Right, so, uh, oh no, that's eight in favour. Uh, those against? Could you please put your hands up? Those against? And those not voting? That, that doesn't, that, uh, that doesn't actually tally up. You're, you're the 10th, I think, Chair. No, I, I voted uh, in favour. No, Councillor right. voted in favour. Um, okay, well, it doesn't tally then. Could we do that again, please? Those, those in favour? Okay, I've got nine in favour, Councillor. Thank you. Those against? And those not voting. So it's uh, granted. Thank you. Right, I, I'd like to move on to item eight before we take a break. Uh, that would bring us to the halfway point. Uh, so item eight is 37 to 39 Cottenham Park Road. And Officer Lewis, could you please present the scheme? Thank you. Hmm. Sorry to keep you. Oh, I've just had a message come up that says screen sharing has stopped. Sorry. Right. Can I just confirm that you can see the images on the screen? Yes, you're good to go. Right. Um, the proposal uh, is to demolish um, two um, unassuming houses on the south side of Cottenham Park Road and to replace them with um, three modern um, uh, houses in a, a, a terrace uh, along with um, a small block um, of um, five flats. Um, for those that are familiar with um, the area between Rains Park and Wimbledon Hill, um, sites um, such as those on Cottenham Park Road um, do uh, change significantly in levels um, from um, uh, the north side to the south side, um, as well as from um, a dropping in levels from um, east uh, to west. Um, on the screen in front of you uh, is an image showing the three modern um, townhouses, front um, and rear, 
and uh, uh, side elevation. Um, we also have Again, in a similar style, um, a modern block um, of uh, flats. If I can just make clear, the dotted line uh, across here is roughly where the wall um, is in front of the, um, uh, uh, the existing um, uh, buildings. I'll show you some photographs um, in, in a second. Um, the area uh, has uh, a number of modern um, houses already. Um, there is, um, or the area is, I suppose, characterized by diversity of dwelling types rather than similarity um, of um, dwelling types. I can just scroll down. So here we have um, uh, the two um, properties to be uh, removed. Uh, this one uh, is the site where planning permission has been granted more recently for um, uh, two uh, new dwellings. So again, something uh, new also being added uh, on the site next door. Some views of the back uh, of the site. Again, looking towards the house. So this is the house where we've already granted planning permission to uh, rebuild. And this is one of the two houses to be um, uh, removed. Um, the scheme's been modified since the earlier refusal and I direct members, um, if I can, to paragraph 3.6 and paragraph 3.7 um, of the uh, officer's uh, report. That sets out in some detail uh, the changes uh, which have been incorporated into the, uh, the latest uh, scheme. The officer's report considers all key aspects of development and concludes the scheme has sought to address earlier concerns and that it can reasonably be supported. The scheme is recommended for approval subject to the completion of the section 106 agreement and conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Officer Lewis. Uh, first speaker I have is uh, Mel Smith. Uh, Mel, are you with us? Mel, if you could please, un if you're with us, if you could please unmute yourself. I'm Keith Thomas. I'm not Mel Smith. I, yeah, I, I, okay, well, well, we'll do you first, uh, Keith, and then... Okay, I'll okay, fine. Good evening. I live at number 45A. This is an overly intensive, ill-conceived and poorly designed scheme that harms the tranquility and views of Holland Garden. It will be directly overlooking the picnic tables and play facilities of the enclosed recreation area for young families. The officer identifies at 2.3 of the officer's report that the area is characterised by terraced, semi-detached and detached houses. In the whole of Cottenham Park Road, there is no precedent for a block of flats. The introduction of flats would fail to comply with the pattern of development surrounding Holland Garden, which is all individual residential houses. It is inconsistent with the local character and therefore fails to respect, reinforce and enhance local character and breaches CS14. In addition, it fails to comply with the local pattern of development policy DM2, D2A1. This scheme would represent a step change in both the type and density of development and set an unwelcome precedent. The local authority have exceeded their housing targets for many years at 7.4 of the officer's report. And therefore this level of densification is not a borough necessity, nor is it site appropriate. Anything over two units on this site would represent a net housing increase for the borough. Eight units is far too much. This level of density engenders poor design that would harm Holland Garden setting. The scheme significantly increases the density replacing two-storey single occupant dwellings with taller and wider four-storey multi-occupant structures. The inappropriate inclusion of flats means that the developer has had to include some amenity space. This results in unsightly precast concrete balconies to the flats and provides poor amenity for occupants. For example, basement bedrooms served only by light wells that would deliver poor daylight, narrow and overly deep 10 metres kitchen living rooms within the houses delivering poor daylight, policy DM2A5. No account has been taken of the imminent planned redevelopment of neighbouring houses 32, 34 and 41. Overall, nine CPZ parties left. will be lost. Pressure on spaces is made worse by regular parking of two zip cars. Residents already struggle to park their cars. 
contrary to the traffic statement, a bus stop is located just 35 metres to the east. Therefore, all new units should be made parking permit free. In these COVID-19 times, it seems even more important to ensure that developers deliver housing which promotes, which provides occupants with good quality indoor and outdoor space. The current submission does neither. It incorporates the bare minimum necessary changes to the refuse scheme to preserve maximum density. I urge you to refuse this ill-conceived, overly dense and poorly designed scheme. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I'll now go back to Mel Smith. Uh, Mel, I can see you as item eight. Are, are you, can you hear us? I have a transcript of his speech, if that helps. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm happy for you to read Mel's script because I, I, I don't think they can hear us or, or certainly we can't hear them. But maybe he's, he hasn't used Outlook before. Maybe he can't unmute. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm happy for you to read his... Uh, You're happy for me to read? Absolutely, yes. Um, Please proceed. This application is a gross overdevelopment of these two sites and totally out of keeping with the surroundings. The previous application was refused on multiple grounds and this application has only tinkered with the application details. To replace one modest house with three cramped houses, four metres wide each, would not be producing very tight units with deficient accommodation amenity space not all above the required 50 square meters. The proposed flats on number 37 also have rooms without direct daylight. All of the proposed units would be very close to their boundary with Holland Gardens and become overpowering to users of the park. There are no similar developments in any of the surrounding areas. This alone makes the proposal out of keeping. Considering also the impact on the road and Holland Gardens emphasizes this point. The reason for the large number of units squeezed onto two sites can only be an attempt to produce a greater profit element for the developer. Whereas the council's aims to create better places to live in, are these units better? Should they fit in with overall form and layout of the surroundings? Do they? The original proposal was refused on the grounds of scale, height, massing and design, resulting in, quote, an overly dominant and cramped form of development, which would adversely affect the amenities of the road and Holland Gardens. The superficial changes in the current application hardly have any effect on these points. Parking permits only restrict parking for one hour each weekday. These eight units could have more than one car each, which could park elsewhere during that hour, perhaps in an adjacent street, or maybe some of the cars could be used for commuting and completely avoid the need for permits. The increase in housing provision by the council has consistently been greater than the required meaning that such a level of density is completely unnecessary. Comment has been made about the retention of much of the boundary wall to One the minute left. Although broken up by a number of entry points, the suggestion that an additional parking space for the central house could be provided would destroy any semblance of the boundary wall. It would also remove the opportunity for the surface water runoff currently proposed in the surface water drainage strategy report. Overall, this application could, should be refused. Can I just point out that Officer Lewis misidentified the property at number 41 that's due to be demolished. He was identifying number 35. It's number 35, uh, sorry, 41 that's due to be demolished, not number 35. Um, it's just as a point of uh, order uh, for the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Keith. Thank you. Uh, uh, Officer Lewis, would, uh, sorry. Uh, I do have David Norris uh, as the agent. David, do we, are you with us? And could you unmute yourself, please? Can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you. Would you like to unmute your microphone? Hello, David. Uh, I, I'll go on to Officer Lewis, if you could uh, make any comments, and I'll then come back to uh, David Norris, see if his microphone's working. Uh, Officer Lewis, do you have any comments? Yes, Sorry. firstly, my apologies for misidentifying the property. Um, the um, comments are those 
on which um, judgments um, uh, will invariably have to be made, such as whether or not a proposal is overly intensive um, on uh, a site and whether or not the densification of the site is appropriate or inappropriate. Um, I would simply flag up to members um, that um, the likely target which will be set in the um, revised London plan will take Merton's housing target from 411 units per year to potentially 918 units per year. And that opportunity sites like this present a real challenge for um, officers in terms of striking the balance between intensification and overdevelopment. Um, officers in this instance um, honestly consider that the proposals optimise the development potential um, for um, this um, site. Um, the case officer um, has also joined uh, the meeting um, and I don't know whether or not he wishes to um, make um, any observations. No. I can't, uh, unless, uh, could they unmute themselves, planning officer, if they want to make any comments? No. Right, I'll go back to David Norris. David Norris, uh, are you able to hear us and can you please unmute your microphone? No, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll open it in that case. I'll open it up to the panel members for questions. Uh, I will come back to you again, David, uh, at the end. Uh, Councillor Dean. Um, I heard from one of the uh, objectors that there are rooms with no natural light. Is that the case? No, there are rooms with limited natural light. Does every, every room have a window? Yes. Okay. Every habitable room has a window. Does every room have a window, though? I can just share the, the screen with you just one moment. I don't mind a yes or a no. Does every room have a window? That's all I need to know. Some of the non-habitable rooms don't have windows. Right. What's a non-habitable room? Uh, a kitchen. So a kitchen and a bathroom may not have windows. Yes, I, 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 I do feel if we're making a decision on what will what could be a multi-million pound development, that we have the opportunity to look at the plans properly. Um, Jonathan, if you can hear me, I can help out here. Thank you. Um, so for two of the um, flats at ground floor and lower ground floor level, um, two of uh, the bedrooms on the lower ground floor level don't have uh, windows. They have skylights or um, uh, uh, kind of like a, um, a light to allow them to um, have access to daylight and sunlight. A light, as in what? A, a light bulb or a window? Uh, sorry, a light wall. So that's so at um, lower ground floor level, uh, that's two of the bedrooms are served by light walls. Okay. Uh, any further questions, Councillor Dean? No, no uh, question. Councillor Christine, please. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I think <laughs> I heard from one of the the. Uh, um uh opposers uh one of the one of the speeches that one of the properties didn't meet the gia or internal space standards is that is that the truth because from the table in the report it looks like they all do that's that's correct the units do do meet um the uh, uh the floor space standards okay, thank you any further questions council making um, could you could you explain on page two one two oh seven that uh, you've got approximately one point two meters higher, which is moderately taller. Now, to me, one point two meters is forty inches, which is uh, more than moderately. I would describe it as. Sorry, sorry, um, chair. Which which paragraph is council making referring to? Uh, on page 207, it is. Yeah. And which paragraph, uh, Councillor Macon? 7.15. 7.15, thank you. Yeah, 
Well, I, I, again, I, as I said, it, the, these are matters of judgment. Um, 1.2 meters, and uh, if you look at the photographs of the uh, of the buildings on the site at the moment, they're, they're sunk quite significantly and um, down from um, uh, from street level. Um, so to um, uh, to bring the buildings up to street level, you might reasonably expect the ridge height or the height of the buildings um, to be um, uh, a little uh, a little higher um, overall. If it was 1.5 meters, would you describe it as moderately as well? Well, uh, again, you know, I think what each application has to be considered um, on its merits. And one of the key um, uh, design attributes of Cottenham Park Road um, is the gradual descent from um, the top of Durham uh, Road um, westwards in the direction um, of um, uh, the A3. So there's no uniform ridge height as there might be in other streets where you have terraced houses um, with um, uh, very similar properties. The properties along um, Cottenham Park Road, um, uh, the ridge heights uh, rise, not because necessarily the buildings are getting bigger and bigger, um, but your, your, the, the elevation um, is increasing as you, as you get up towards um, Wimbledon Hill. So that, that, that's why there's the difference. So one and a half metres um, on parts of Durham Road in terms of a difference might on one side of a property be particularly pronounced, but on the other side of a property where you're going down the hill actually mean that the ridge heights um, marry up. So I think you've got, to you've got to factor that into making any assessment. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Mekin. Uh, no I'd like to move on to comments, please, by the... Uh, Councillor, is that a comment or a question? You like a, to comment, a comment for me. On comment, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think I think if um, if you took every every single house in Merton, you could demolish it and put up flats. You can um, based on this, and I, I think we always need to keep to a broad mix. This is clearly an area where there are housing uh, homes rather than uh, apartments, and uh, I do think that um, this is frankly full of holes. Um, I don't think the design of the three terrace houses is uh, amenable to the area. I think uh, the designs are very poor. Um, we can use the word contemporary, but I think they're very ugly. Uh, extremely narrow. I mean, they are contrived in, in what they're delivering. But I, I feel really, really uh, disturbed by the flats, that there are bedrooms without windows. Uh, and, and we can argue it as much as we like as a non-habitable room. But, uh, and that may be the legal definition, but uh, if you're working from home um, and that is your only room, uh, then I, I think that's disgraceful. Uh, there is no need to do this based on the site. Um, and I think there has to be um, a new design here and we have to reject it on a number of things. We, we cannot, I mean, these are not affordable homes. This is not gonna help the homeless. This is not gonna help the housing list. Uh, a one or two bedroom flat in this area is going to cost at least 400,000 and I'm being conservative. This is not going to make a difference to the housing list. But what we should be doing as a committee is making sure that everything built here is reasonable to live in, whoever you are. And if you're a, a nine year old, as uh, Councillor Henry mentioned earlier, you shouldn't be living in a bedroom with no windows. And I think that's one of the reasons we need to reject it. I think we also need to reject it on bulk and massing. It needs to come back and be redesigned. And I don't think you can get three houses on that one site with the, the, the width of them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, Ken, just um, back to what Councillor Dean said. Um, to be honest with you, I, 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 would never, I would never live in a house without windows. So can you just explain to me? Because sometimes we may, is, is there a wind uh, opening in, like uh what do you call it now it's a uh, roof sunlight window roof window skylight skylight sorry is there a skylight window because i know the skylight window can open you know is, is there a skylight window or there's no window at all in these bedrooms 
chair, the, um, uh, the front facing um, bedrooms um, in the flat uh, block um, have light wells um, onto which um, the rooms uh, would have um, an outlook. Um, so the cross section of the drawing shows uh, a significant space um, in front of um, uh, the accommodation at um, lower street um, level. Um, so uh, not unique, the kind of thing which you might often find in parts of Victoria and London, um, but perhaps uh, a little different from that that you might find around this part of Brains Park. It's like a pipe, isn't it? It's not. It's not a. It's not a. Um, it's it's a. It's a pipe bringing in light, isn't it? These are not windows. Let, let, let's be clear. They're not windows. I mean, we don't need to do this. We don't need to do this. Okay. We do not need to offer people bedrooms with no light, no windows. Uh, Councillor Ward. Thank you. Um... This is getting slightly frustrating. It's a light well. There is a window and that leads on to a patio at below a low ground, below low, below floor level, but does have natural sunlight coming through a window into the room. The officer was fully clear. There are no habitable rooms that do not have windows with natural Chair, sunlight. I, I find it odd. No, 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 no you don't interrupt me. Answering my question. Uh, will you keep answering my questions? I'll have the officers. Well, I'll have the officers speaking. respond to my questions, please. Yeah, please sort this out. Yeah, if you, Chair, if you don't mind, he he seems to keep yeah, answering my questions as an officer. Can I finish, please? Uh, well, don't keep answering my questions if you don't mind. Sorry, Councillor Ward, do you have any comments? Yes, make? I do, and I want to finish my comment. Councillor Dean has, has consistently said there are bedrooms with no windows. That is not true of this scheme. The, count, the officers were absolutely clear. Every habitable room has a window. Councillor Dean has been on this committee for longer than I have. Yeah, and Chair, Chair, can, uh, Chair, can we stop the obsession yeah. with... Uh, can we just stop the obsession with responding to me and please respond to the application? If you don't mind, I, I'm not, I find it quite strange that the council has an obsession of the responding to me. Falsehoods and untruths are being said about it. I find it very strange. No, we cannot discuss the application if people accept the falsehoods that you've previously come out with. Uh, Chair, Chair, would you mind asking the councillor to stop being so rude and being obsessed? Can he, if you've got some questions, would he answer, ask them? Can you please... Uh, Not questions, this is comment. I will ask both of you to uh, leave the meeting. Thank you. Right. Uh, okay. No further comment. Right. I I'll believe... finish calmly if I can. Every uh, room, every room in, the the in the proposed development, every room in the proposed development has a window with natural light. Okay, thank you. Therefore, uh, oh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Uh, chair, uh, thank you. Um, I'm a bit confused, you know. I just want to know because if there's no window, it can be open and closed. I mean, it, for me, that's not a room, right? So we want, I personally want to know is there a window that can be open and closed? Uh, Councillor Lewis, would you be able to uh, maybe share a screen uh, and uh, answer Councillor Henry's? Uh, Yes. Thank you, officer. If I can take members to Sorry, Chair. Ah. Right. If I can just go back through the um, uh, the drawings. You'll see um, on the, sorry, on the floor plans, if 
might just scroll up just a little bit more. Um, can you see roughly where the um, uh, the cursor is circling? Yeah. So that's a light well. That's 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 um, pretty much a um, a, a square um, hole pushed down into the ground onto which this bedroom, where the arrow is. Maybe, maybe I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit for you. Sorry to keep you waiting. No, it doesn't seem to want to do it. Um, but yes, yeah, sorry. So there's the light well there. If we look at um, this drawing here, whoops. Right, here we go. Oh. Right, that's a bit better. Where you can see the um, cursor circling, that's a, that's a void pushed down into the ground. Um, the kind of void that you have in front of a lot of Victorian um, uh, properties. And you can see that this room and this room look out onto that um, little space. And then if we go to the, the first, sorry, the, the ground floor um, uh, plan. Not too far. you can see again the annotation light well so there's where the um the cursor is moving on the on the screen you can see light well there and a light well um there so it's simply a space in front of the building which goes lower than the surrounding um front um I suppose front garden, front 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 yard um, uh, area uh, to provide natural light to the lower um, ground floor uh, accommodation, and I think it's also marked a bit more clearly on the um, on the cross sections um, to. Um, the property. Uh, just a second. So, yeah, we've got sorry to keep you. Here we go. So at the front, we've got this space, which creates this, this drop. And if we look at, yes, there we go. That's a nice clear one. Yeah. So this is a, 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 a section across um, the um, flats part um, of the scheme. And you can see that's a window to one of the bedrooms, that's a window to the other bedroom, and then the light areas either side form that sort of wraparound dressing area and um, a cloakroom uh, area, which you could see on the floor plans. So there are, there are windows um, at, at the lower uh, ground level. Right. Thank you, um, uh, Officer Lewis. I, I am conscious of time, and I also uh, believe uh, the agent David Norris has uh, joined us by phone. Uh, David, can you hear us? And can you unmute yourself? David? Uh, David, can you hear us? Hello, David. 
I'd like to give him a, a chance to speak before we go into the vote. David, are you able to hear us? Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Uh, David, yes, uh, uh, could you please do your speech? Okay. 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 Uh, I'll, I'll, good, ev good evening, good councillors. Uh, we would like to take the opportunity. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, uh, have you got a, tea, have you got a computer on as well? I'll, uh, I'll uh, just leave that. Can you hear me now? That's better, yes. Please, please. All right, excellent. Thank you. Apologies, uh, we had some problems with the technology this then, I think, but uh, uh, good evening, councillors. We would like to take the opportunity to respond to concerns raised by the two previous speakers and wholeheartedly support the planning officer's report. In the first instance, it is important to state that the scheme that you see before you this evening has been worked up in consultation with the planning officer to create a high quality development that responds well to the character of the area and protects the immediacy of the neighbouring properties. The objective was to demonstrate how a strong contemporary design can be integrated into a suburban site without it being visually obtrusive or having an adverse effect on the existing streetscape. The site topography varies greatly from street level to the southern boundary, and the scheme takes advantage of this, allowing the built form of the development to nestle on the sloping site in harmony with its neighbours. The spacing or rhythm of the street scene is also reflected in the scheme, with the spacing between the blocks being greater than the remaining properties on this side of Cottenham Park Road, which are a mix of closely spaced semis or terrace houses. A gap of 2.2 metres between the blocks and 1.2 metres to the boundary with number 35 is greater than the general one metre spacing found in the road. The front and building lines are set significantly back from the approved scheme at number 41, Cottenham Park mm. Road. The, the properties are marginally higher than the existing houses, which are particularly low, and the heights of the proposed buildings are more in accord with the height and scale of adjoining properties. The gable features employed in the design of the houses and flats have been influenced by many of the houses along this part of the road, and as noted by the planning officer, maintains the general rhythm of development along Cottenham Park Road, owing to having comparable ridge height, pitch roofs, and gables and gaps between buildings. The use of high quality materials to be used in the scheme have been chosen to be sympathetic to their surroundings rather than be pastiche. In essence, the proposal has been designed and developed to be modest in its external form, lower than the previously refused scheme, follow the streetscape of Cottenham Park Road and sit sympathetically on the site and age well with a minimum of, a maiden, with a minimum of maintenance. The housing mix between Peeps Road and Durham Road is 12 detached, 10 semi-detached and 15 terraced houses. In addition, there are a number of blocks of flats in the locality, particularly in Peeps Road. The mix of houses and flats in the development reflect this character. All of the units and room sizes exceed the minimum requirements, as does the external amenity space and accords with the National and London Plan standards. The streetscape will be enhanced by the proposal with the front boundary wall with piers retained along part of the frontage to accord with that found on adjoining properties. In addition, a grass lawn will be provided along part of the frontage and all of this with the additional planting of trees will further help soften the impact on the development. The impact from the rear, notably Holland Gardens, will not be significant. A series of brick gables and modest glazing and high quality architecture will be glimpsed from this public space. As with the neighbouring properties, the blocks will hardly be seen due to the heavy tree cover on the boundary and within the park. The developer has agreed to enter into Section 106 agreement, which considerably limits parking. The existing properties can apply for six parking permits, whilst the proposed development can only apply for three. The three family houses have one off-street space each, but cannot apply for parking permits, whilst the three larger family flats can apply for one parking permit only, and the remaining two one-bedroom flats are car-free. The flats are provided with ample bike storage. This limits car use and more than meets the council's parking policy. Sustainable principles are embraced across the development, meeting the 19% improvement of building regulations and achieving internal water usage rates not in excess of 105 litres per day. We've also sought to protect the immunity of adjoining properties with no significant overlooking, loss of outlook or overshadowing being created to either neighbouring dwellings. Importantly, the scheme will provide an additional six homes and add to Merton's housing target figures, and also as noted by the planning officer, which is consistent with the London plan density thresholds. In conclusion, the proposal makes efficient use of this brownfield site by creating a high quality development that will positively enhance this part of Cottenham Park Road 
without harm to current immunity or highway conditions. It will make an important contribution to Merlin's housing target, and as such, we hope that you will support the planning officer's recommendation and approve the application. Thank you very much, and appreciate your patience. Uh, thank you, uh, David Norris. Thank you. Uh, right, I'd like to now move on to the vote. So, uh, clearly, please show your hands. Those in favour? Okay, that looks like five counts are six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Eight. Chair, it's eight. Eight. It's eight, I think. One, two, three. Could you please keep your hands up? Okay, eight, yes. Uh, those against? Looks like uh, one councillor. And those not uh, voting? One not voting. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, granted, Ami. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to take a 10 minute break as we're halfway through. So uh, please go and um, uh, have a cup of tea and I shall see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Right. Uh, are we all back? Uh, so that one, two, three. Council. I'll just wait for Council Southgate and Councillor Dehaney. Yes. Councillor Dehaney, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Uh, Councillor McGrath, are you back? So just waiting for Councillor Southgate and Councillor McGrath. Uh, Councillor McGrath, are you back with us? Uh, we'll just give it another couple of minutes. So we're halfway through. We have another five items to go. Excellent. Uh, I think we're all back. Uh, welcome back to the committee. Uh, we are now on to item 9, 115 Graham Road, Wimbledon. And Officer Bryson, uh, would you please present the scheme? Thank you, Chair. I hope you members you can see that. Um, the application comprises 115 Graham Row, which is an existing uh, 1970s purpose-built block of uh, six flats uh, on the western side of Graham Road. Um, there is vehicle access to its side, which provides access to car parking and garaging at the rear. Um, the proposal itself is to add an additional floor to the building to provide two one-bedroom flats. The proposal also includes um, some other um, other aspects of the scheme as such as a digital rear private garden spaces to the two existing ground floor flats, um, additional bin storage and additional cycle storage and other improvements to the appearance of the building at the front. Um, proposed flats themselves, labelled flat seven and flat eight. Uh, so running, running front to back, each flat would have a um, small balcony at the rear um, bedrooms at the front, uh, so outlook uh, both to the front and rear. So the proposed design itself would take the form of a, a sort of mansard roof design um, with brick elevations to the side, um, slightly set in from the surrounding um, edge of the existing block of flats. There are no windows proposed in the side elevations of the top additional top floor. So here looking at the other side elevation as well. So you can just see the um, dormers coming out the front and the rear. So looking at the front elevation, the street scene is, is varied down Graham Road. So we have um, typical traditional two-story old properties here. There's more modern um, block of flats built in Victorian style here to the right-hand side. And then the proposal is for this extra floor here. Some other improvements to the building proposed are replacing the two hallway windows here and upgrading the existing tile hanging on the outside as well. 
looking at the rear, um, as I say, the two flats up here, um, and then bin storage and cycle storage at the back. Um, just a section drawing to show the levels. The applicant submitted with the application some um, 3D visual aids, which I know that members were sent sent around earlier today. Um, so just to go through uh, some of these. So as I said, some some other improvements to the building as proposed. So we're looking at some um, slate tiles um, to the main roof, and then more of a um, lead canopy to the to the some of the dormers. Um, so you can just see here these from the front really at the back as i said there is proposed to be an additional private garden space for two of the existing ground floor units which is a benefit to the scheme um, we have conditions in, in the recommendation that improvements such as those are actually done before the first occupation of the two flats proposed this evening um, so that would ensure that the applicant does does fulfill those um, those proposals and here at the back. So there's quite a few submitted, but um, quite useful in putting in, in terms of the context to what's proposed. Uh, proposal would leave, um, originally proposed for some additional communal outdoor space for, for the existing flats as well, but due to um, parking Allocate to the existing six flats here, um, along with a single garage for each one. Um, cars need to maneuver to in order to get out um, of the access way, so that was actually removed from the scheme. Existing site pictures, um, based on the elevations proposed, the actual height of the proposed additional floor wouldn't exceed the height of the adjacent, more modern building next door. Um, so, as I said, some improvements to these windows here as well. Uh, site here, so again, looking at up there. At the rear, so the bin storage would be would be increased along with bike storage and two private gardens for these two flats here at the back. Neighbouring property to the to the right hand side, looking at the rear, number one one seven. And just showing at the rear there the existing garages and parking spaces in front. Um, overall chair, um, officers now satisfied with the design for this application in comparison to the previous refusal and uh, recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Officer Bryson. Uh, Dr. Sheriff, are you with us? And could you please unmute yourself? Can you hear me? That's better. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I am a current leaseholder of the building and I speak on behalf of four of the six leaseholders uh, when raising these concerns. Leaseholders and tenants are almost unanimously opposed to the development. To contextualize this application, the developer purchased the freeholders property less than a year ago and has already offered to sell it to the leaseholders in July 2020 for three times the price paid. He does not seem to be genuinely interested in creating affordable, high quality accommodation. Planning permission would grant the developer the means for significant profit, but would leave current and future residents of eight flats a considerably worsened quality of living. My first objection is about the excessive height and bulk of the proposed building. There are no other four-story buildings or blocks of eight flats in the vicinity. It is wholly out of character for the area and visually obtrusive. Immediately adjoining properties are either two or two and a half stories. This would be four. A 2019 planning application was denied because the addition of another story would result in a building that is four stories and that would be excessive in height, bulk and massing and out of kilter with the character of the street. The height and width of the proposed building has not substantively changed in this planning application and I can't see why permission would be granted on this occasion. The current building height is almost equal to properties on both sides. The proposed new elevation is over 2.5 metres higher than the neighbouring houses at 117 and 119 Graham Road. It would tower over a third higher than its neighbour. Due to the roof design, it would look to be even higher because the sloped roof of 117 Graham Road begins at 5.7 metres height, while the proposed height of this development extends like a sheer face to 10.4 metres high. 
My second objection is that the plans to build private gardens, bin storage and cycle storage to the rear significantly reduces resident outdoor space and does not leave sufficient manoeuvring space for cars to park. Almost half of the current communal area, around 100 metres squared, has been removed in the proposed plans, most of it for private gardens, which three quarter of the building would not have access to. No communal gardens are proposed. This would a remove the only outdoor space used by children of the building, which has been a lifeline in COVID lockdown. B, eliminate any possibility for visitor parking, which um, the councillors have seen in the photos. And C, fail to reflect the reality of the large space needed for residents to reverse park in front of their garages. Garages are too small to fit cars into, so see the photo that I've circulated showing how cars need to park. In reality, this would eliminate children's outdoor space, remove off-street parking for residents of the flats and add to the overcrowded parking situation in the W4 parking zone. My third objection is about the living standards of the proposed new flats. Flat 8 is shown as having a gross internal area of only 48 metres squared, which the planning officer acknowledges in his report to be less than the nationally mandated standards. This discrepancy is 4%, which would not be insignificant for someone living in the property. Secondly, these standards are mandatory and cannot be put aside. Proposed Flat 8 does not even meet the bare minimum nationally described space standard and the Mayor of London's Policy 3.5 on quality and design of housing development. The proposed, application is, the proposed application is designed to increase the value for the freehold of the developer to sell onwards rather than a good faith attempt to construct viable... Thank you very much, um, Dr. Shev. Your three minutes are up. Ricky Sellers from Brass Architecture. Uh, Ricky, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yep, please. You have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, just for our context, it's just been mentioned there was a previous application in 2019 that was refused um, on many grounds, um, and the conclusion of that refusal recommended pre op advice with any new proposal. Um, with that in mind, we came on board at the start of the year, inherited the scheme, revised the design, and then immediately proceeded uh, with pre-application consultation with Merton in February of this year. Thereafter, the case officers came back with a, a host of uh, feedback, all of which were taken on board within our design. Um, it was agreed thereafter that we would um, formally submit the planning application in April. Um, to which we learned to learn there was a number of, of objections in June, um, seven noted, uh, mainly from existing tenants and immediate neighbours. Um, with, with that in mind, it was agreed with the case officer that we would pause at that moment. We would um, address the, the main objections raised and once again reconsult the scheme throughout July. Re revised designs and detailed commentary was circulated. This covered highway matters, vehicle sweeps, as mentioned by uh, the previous speaker, um, refuse and recycling points, amenity provision, amongst many other items. We also undertook a measured survey of the street scene to qualify datums, roof heights, roof pitches, and the like. Um, just for context, if our application was approved today, the first port of call would be to formulate a comprehensive construction management plan for the project. This would cover all matters with, with the construction, including access, working hours, and, and many other muted points raised by uh, tenants. Um, we would urge the committee to grant approval this evening, given that we have gone through the pre-application procedures muted by the uh, planning officers that we've taken on board all feedback so far and integrated this with- One minute outcome. left. The existing building is very dated and there is a whole sweep of upgrades across the site as well as the, as the building itself, uh, primarily to the front boundary wall and the entrance canopy itself. Um, the planning officer report this evening clearly demonstrates our scheme is an improvement on the 2019 offering. And most importantly, the planning officers conclude in their report that our design is of a high quality. Our client is happy to proceed with the muted planning conditions proposed by the planning officers. And we are more than happy to include future neighbourly consultations if you're minded to append that to the approval this evening. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sellers. Uh, move on to... Officer Bryson, do you have any uh, comments and would you like to make any? Uh, I don't, Chair, not for this application at the moment. Thank you. 
I'll open up to the panel. Uh, questions, please. Councillor McGraw. Yes, um, can I just um, ask the officers about a couple of comments uh, that were made? Um, first of all, about one of the new units being below the required standard. Is that, is that correct? And the other one is about the loss of um, play space uh, for children in, in the back. Is that, is, that, is that correct? That seems a slightly odd thing for us to be wanting to support. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. In regard to the space standards, yes, um, flat. Uh, if I can just share my screen quickly. Sorry. Chair, yes, it, uh, flat eight um, falls short of these space standards by two square meters. Um, and that is this, this flat here. Um, what we have to have to balance is, um, well, is it, although it is a shortfall, is, is that enough for us to recommend refusal? Um, and now given the, the outdoor space provision, uh, the outlook both front and back, um, on this occasion, we don't consider that to be to be to warrant a refusal of the application. So that is a that's a, a balanced judgment to be made. Um, ultimately, it's a, a decision for members to make this evening on that. Um, loss of play space. Um, as far as we're aware, the at the rear of the site, it is um, it's currently all tarmac hard standing. Um, I'll see if I can go to the photographs to um, have, a, have a further look, but. Um, as far as we're aware, it is all hard standing in front of the garaging at the back. Um, so whilst perhaps some, there's some aspect of, of element of play that happens out the back, but it is on tarmac in front of garaging, which is used for um, perhaps more storage, but there's car parking in front of the garaging serving each, each uh, unit. Um, but the scheme does include a benefit, which is to provide, although it's not for, for all the flats, but to... Um, private gardens to the two ground floor flats which are which are can feasibly be done because they're at ground floor level so there is a um, there is a benefit there to the two ground floor flats but um, acknowledge that there, there is no further benefit in terms of outdoor space for the existing remaining flats thank you uh, thank you uh, so great. Uh, any more further questions Councillor Macon. Just a point of clarification of what uh, play officers said then was about parking outside the garage. Isn't the garage supposed to be where you park inside it, that's out the line? Therefore, you're creating space for actually 12 cars then, six in the garage and six out of the garage. Uh, yes, my comments were in regards to the fact a lot of the time with these very old garages, they're, they're quite thin. Um, so my comments were based on, well, perhaps they're probably probably more used for storage, but there's car parking, one space per flat in front of each garage space. But if someone wants to obviously use them for cars, that, that's, you know. It means there's purpose. space, there's, in my mind, there's space for two parking, two, two cars, then, one in the garage and one outside the garage which is far more on the way above what we've expected for the plans. Okay, um, thank you. Any further questions? Comments by members? Councillor Southgate. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a really you know, sad and utilitarian looking building um, and I don't know who who approved it in the first place but any offer to, to facelift the front I think is, is is to be welcomed and the um, shortfall on the amenity space for the top flat there is a balcony you can sit out there and look at the trams going by um, I mean all in all I, th I think it is uh, I'm slightly concerned that people should attach more imports to parking their cars and to providing space for their children to play but 
that's in the way of the world, and I don't think it's something we can influence either way. But on, on balance, I'm, I'm certainly happy to approve this scheme. Uh, thank you, Councillor Southgate. Any further comments? Councillor McGraw. My, my concern about this is that this is by no means the first time that we have been asked to approve flats which are a bit smaller than the standard. And, and, and you know, there seems to be an increasing trend of developers knowing that they can get away with building a slightly smaller um, development than the standard. And I think if you have a standard, we should not approve flats which are smaller than it. I am concerned, and perhaps this is another question for um, officers, about what seems to be taking away communal space um, where children can play. And, and in these days, any space where children can play is better than nothing, even if it is not a garden, um, in favor of privatize, privatizing that space and, and particular flat owners getting the benefit. Um, it does concern me, but I don't know, and perhaps officers could advise whether that's a planning consideration that we can take into account. But apart from that, I would object to it on the basis that the flat is flat eight is too small. Okay, thank you. Any further comments before I move on to the vote? Councillor Dean. Councillor, could you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. I'm sorry, I thought you might prefer that. Um, the um, I'd just like to echo what Councillor McGrath has said. These are minimum standards, not maximum standards or average standards. It just doesn't make any sense if the standards are there and it's the policy that's been through the full council where each one of us has said that we'll keep to it and then we're not keeping to it. Um, and it would be rejected on appeal on that basis. So um, if we are going to offer accommodation, at least let's offer a minimum standard. Um, not least, of course, this is going to put undue um, pressure on the six uh, flat holders there already. I don't think it's right that uh, they should have the grief and then the new people moving in also have the grief of having a smaller home. So I, I will back Councillor McGrath's opinion uh, and reject it if that's what he's proposing. Yes, it is. Councillor McGrath, would you like to make a proposal? Uh, could I just have an answer from the officer about the, the reduction in communal space and whether that's a valid planning reason? I think, Chair, given that it's um, it is tarmac um, and it is a it's mainly an access way to the to each of those garages at the back for vehicles, um, it would be difficult to 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 um, to object on those grounds. Um, it's not physically proposed, not physically taking away communal gardens as such. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's is it. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think it would be. Um, you could object on those grounds. There is still some remaining communal, obviously, space in front of the garaging, like there is, albeit a little bit smaller. Okay, but then, uh, then I would like to object on the basis that the uh, flat eight is smaller than the standard. Uh, do you have a seconder? Uh, yes, I'll second that. Okay. So I'd like to next move to the vote. Uh, the first vote is. Um, Councillor McGrath's proposal uh, that the flats are below the minimum standard. So uh, the vote is to reject based on Councillor McGrath's proposal that the flats are below minimum standard. Those in favour? Five, Chair. Uh, I now, could you please hold your hand back again, please? All right. I can only see oh, four hands. Yeah. So, Ola, what what did you make that, Ola? Uh, so I, I make that four. In favour? Yeah, yes. I concur. That was definitely four. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, those against Council McGrath's proposal? Six. Six, chair. Six. Okay, that's fine. So uh, that, that fails. We then go on to the vote on the planning application itself. Those in favour uh, of 
the application. Those against? Okay. Yeah, and uh, that's it. So it's granted. Thank you. Now move on to item 10, 64 to 76, Kingston Road, Wimbledon. And Officer Bryson, could you please present the scheme? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, the application site comprises 64 to 76 Kingston Road. Um, the site is somewhat almost um, divided into two. Um, so on the left hand side on this um, plan here, you have the building uh, known as the Manor Club building um, with um, outdoor green open space to the south. And on the right hand side, there is a small building with um, uh, car sales, former car sales garage um, over here. Uh, the site is on the Kingston Road. Um, you have the locally listed building further to the west and you have residential properties to the south and southwest, uh, some more residential properties to the north and also some other commercial properties in the surroundings. This is the current site plan. Um, so the existing building known as a manor club would be extended and converted to residential flats. The existing building on the right hand side um, would be demolished along with the car um, display area and a new block of flats erected on that site. This is the existing Manor Club building. Um, so it is a, um, uh, a character building um, with lots of its original features. Um, the proposal would also enhance and put back some original features which have been lost. Um, the proposal also extends it and, um, and converts it. So the proposal itself is for 26 flats in total. Um, there would be 11 flats in what's called building A in your agenda and 15 flats in building B. So as I said earlier, this is a proposed site plan. So building A extended, fully back, fully integrated extension. Um, children's play area provided also here and also the communal outdoor space would remain as later lawn to be used along with cycle parking for building A. Building B would have 15 flats would be an entire new build structure um, here. In between, you would have um, bin storage here um, and um, bin collection point would actually be off um, the residential um, Brownmere Road to the east following highways objection to bin collection being off the Kingston Road due to the presence of the bus stop. So some 3D visuals submitted with the application. Um, just members note the buildings won't be rendered. Um, this is just how the drawings are done. So it will be uh, facing brick to both the new build and, and obviously the existing building itself. Um, so existing building here from Kingston Road and then you've got the proposal here, the new build to its left hand side. So the scheme you'll see in the agenda, the scheme has been amended during the assessment of the application. Um, since its first submission, notably an, a, a floor has been removed from the existing box of flats and further design improvements made. Also, some re reintroducing some original features which have been lost to the original building, such as these two pillar points here. So, in terms of street scene aspects, the height of the, build, the new build building would respect the height of the existing building on the site. Um, some section drawings I'll come to. So this is the proposed ground floor plan for the existing um, Manor Club building itself. Um, so 
the way this building has building's been designed, there would be a basement below, but the flats would be designed as being split level. Um, I have put a full schedule of accommodation in the modification sheet, um, which I acknowledge wasn't in the in the agenda. Um, large light wells proposed at the back to allow for light in, um, and also smaller ones at the front. Uh, first floor, uh, the flats would be on one floor, uh, one level throughout from first floor up. Um, apologies first floor in the existing building. Um, so we have uh, they're fairly spacious flats. The majority of them you'll see within the in the table um, in the mods sheets that the, uh, a lot of them exceed the space standards. Um, the existing building has quite a unique uh, stair court at the front. So that's been that's been respected um, to try and make the, um, the flats work with that. As I said earlier, just reintroducing some original features. There's an old picture of the building here, how it used to appear. Um, so we're reintroducing some of those. Uh, turning to elevations, so uh, as I said, fully integrated extension going to the rear. Um, this is a section through, so um, you can see the basement here, but the ground level would remain here. Um, dormer features and materials would all match the existing building. Uh, the first floor flats, um, apologies. Sorry, second floor rear is a split level um, and they would have accommodation above that third floor level. Um, and then there'll be two extra flats within the roof as well. Um, but that is just due to the nature of the building in terms of how it's currently laid out. And this is the basement for the existing building as well. So again, split level to the ground floor flats. So there's no whole flat within the basement. Turning to the new build building, building B, on the site. Um, so this would also contain a basement, um, but again, the, the basement accommodation will be split level with the ground floor, so there wouldn't be an entire flat within the basement. Um, also, the new build would accommodate um, cycle storage within the basement down the, down the ramp using the existing, using these proposed stairs, along with, along with a, a lift um, going up through the building. So looking at ground floor, uh, proposal seeks access to the ground floor flats um, with their own front door, uh, which is welcomed. Uh, the two flats on the end are on one floor and these two in the middle are split level with the basement below. First floor, um, flats are all on, all on one floor. Because um, the building is, is almost square-like, um, you do get um, the way it's been designed is for dual aspect is achieved for the flats. Um, and along with winter gardens proposed so that the balconies aren't, aren't protruding uh, from the building. Uh, second floor level, as you go taller, the building um, does come in. So at the back here. Third floor, which is the top floor level here. So the top floor is set, set back from all sides, um, also with a um, different material to the to the brick. Solar panels proposed on the roof as well. Uh, accommodation, so looking at the um, new build block of flats itself, so view from the rear, as I said, there's a um, slight variance here. Um, winter gardens proposed so that the balcony is not protruding um, and, and the material for the top floor um, is different and set back. Looking at the side, so this is the view from the neighbouring residential road, Brisbane Road, to the east. Um, you can see a gap has been maintained here between the existing residential property and the new build flats. Looking almost in, in between um, the two buildings, this is what it would look like here. And then from the front, um, as you see here. So, as I said earlier, to punch through and have 
direct access to the flats um, from the main road um, to make it better quality accommodation. Some design details, so you'll see um, exposed, exposed spacing brick proposed with some slight setback and different type of material, so a different colour brick proposed, sorry, in the round the window reveals to um, enhance the design. Um, and here just some further design aspects. Uh, some slight pictures. So adjacent to the site to the west is a, a extension, large extension being constructed on the adjacent locally listed building. Um, this is the Manor Club building here itself. So as I said, fully refurbished throughout, some original features put back in to try and enhance the building. Um, this is the view on Brisbane Road, so um, car sales garage and existing building here. Um, disabled parking space would, would be proposed here, which is using the existing drop curb. And a view step further back, so um, to the height of the existing building is a pinch point, so um, a four-storey building proposed, but the top floor is set back and the height respects the, the height of the existing building as well. At the rear of the property, as I said, the, the rear extension is fully integrated um, to bring that back to try and retain that character. Um, and looking to the rear, so you can see the, 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 the sort of grassy space at the moment. So within the current local plan for Merson, that is um, designated open space under policy. Um, so it is afforded protection under that policy. Um, but it is proposed to be used for communal garden space for all flats. Both, um, both blocks would have access to it. Uh, Chair, so refer to, to the modification sheet which sets out the schedule of accommodation um, that we have set out there. Um, overall, it's considered to propose a um, good standard of residential accommodation and make good use of an existing building and brownfield site adjacent to it um, to provide residential accommodation. So overall, Chair, officers recommend permission be granted subject to legal agreement and conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Sarah Sharp, um, uh, could you please unmute your microphone? Thank you. Can you hear us? Sarah? We can't hear you. Sarah? All right. Just about. Can you hear? Yes, no. hello. You have three minutes. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's better. You have three minutes. Okay, let's go. Okay. Um, this is such a wasted opportunity to create something amazing. I strongly we uh, welcome the retention of 76 Kingston Road. It's not just an empty detached two-storey building as the officer describes. It's a historic 1891 John Innes and Henry Quartermain building built as a, a working men's club. It's about to be locally listed thanks to an application request by the council officer. Um, local history does matter, and it is thanks to Council Le uh, Leader, Council Leader Stephen Allen Bridges, that the building facade is being retained as he also believes it has a positive impact on the streetscape alongside the facade of Merton Hall. It will be good to see the Man Club back in use, but I believe that cramming in as many as 11 units as planned is the development. The basement flats should really go. They are below par and poorly lit. And there's been extensive basement digging and development already occurring ahead of the application. Uh, I'm still waiting a year on to hear from the enforcement officer. So I would urge that this work is independently assessed. The main issue here is block B, the car showroom site, which undermines the application. It's out of scale. The form and design create a harmful anomaly rather than a positive impact. It really needs to go back to the drawing board to incorporate the applicant's initial plans with bay windows and pitched roof and tiles. Some of the traditional elements which would marry well with Manor Club and a church next door and the majority of Edwardian and Victorian buildings on Kingston Road. Why were these planning officers in the process? I welcome the lowering height to four stories. But the uh, Sarah? I think we've lost your connection. Okay. Hello, Sarah. And it's still out, utterly out to the residential homes behind it. It's clumsy. Yeah. Uh, 
Hello. Sarah? What? Uh, we, 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 we lost your connection. Um, wait. You want to just try and use the audio and no video? Hello? Hello? Right. I, I think we may have lost uh, Sarah Sharp. So, you. are you back? Hello? Why is it? Sarah, I, I may come back to you later on, but uh, I'd like to move on to Jay Patel. Uh, Jay, are you with us? And could you please unmute your microphone? Can you hear us? Good evening, Chairman. I'm here. Yeah, Jay, you have three minutes. Okay. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to address the planning committee. The proposals have, have been prepared to address extensive consultation with officers and, and, and local residents. We, the scheme was revised three times during the submission process, and each division was sent to the contact person identified by the local residents. We addressed all the issues raised by officers, and according to the planning application, is recommended for approval in a balanced judgment. The scheme has been significantly revised since pre-application stages. Sarah points out the original design had a traditional building on the corner, but in reality, it doesn't work because you've got the, two, the, road, the road frontages. It was necessary to address that corner properly. The proposal provides 26 residential flats, in, which include affordable housing. The proposal contributes to the council's housing provision and the affordable housing will be secured by a section 106 agreement, which includes a review mechanism to ensure that the correct amount of affordable housing is provided as the development progresses. In conclusion, I said the development makes efficient use of brownfield land. We've taken two years of discussion with council and residents, as far as I can tell, and the measures restore and extend the late Victorian building, including restoring the front facade, retaining all the windows, um, and that makes that will finish off the comparison between old and new very well. The explanation of the basement extension works have already been provided to the residents. The building was in poor state. We explained to the council to keep the building, we would need to do some supportive and restorative work of, of the foundations. And that work was done uh, to make sure the building doesn't deteriorate any further. I'd, I'd personally like to thank officers for the proactive engagement on, on, and forbearance on these applications. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, I believe Sarah probably had one minute left, so if you don't mind, I'll try and see if she can, can get back to it. Sarah, are you? Can you hear us this time, Rand? I, I can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, you have one. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. You have one minute left in which to finish your speech, your presentation. Okay. Well, that's going to be a little bit. I, I don't know where I stopped. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so I don't know where I got to. Okay, don't start me yet. Give me a second. Um, we want new homes, but how are you going to improve poor quality examples as justification to build more? There are planning considerations with planning laws to counter such design. Um, initially, um, um, so um, the building does have some red and yellow brick, but the extensive use of black metal roof and powdered gray for windows and doors is disproportionate to the amount of brick and it makes the whole building seem funerary. Um, initially, the, the planning offices were keen to preserve the side hanging windows of the Manor Club, but now the building line's been pushed forward. So it actually squashes and obscures those windows, creating a heavy dominant presence with the, with the Manor Club. Why wasn't this application submitted to the DRP and why was only a DRP member uh, consulted on the plans? Um, so if, is it housing at any cost? I'm sure some councillors will say, yes, it is but it is generic. Um, the, the block B undermines the whole application. The, it doesn't, it causes harm rather than promotes and makes a, a positive contribution to, to the landscape, to the streetscape. Uh, I'm sorry, I've just completely lost everything. So at the very least, the black windows, the black roof um, just are terrible. They, they just do not fit in at all. They need to be changed. Please, as part of materials, if you are going to approve this, which I think you probably are, um, Fine, please, please do something about the black. It is very funerary and oppressive and depressing. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, Sarah, thank you very much for that. Um, Officer Bryson, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this, this is an application that's been it's been with us as officers for for a while, as you can see from the um, from its reference number. Um, but it has been subject to a number of amendments as we've gone through um, with the application. So a number of there's a following responses from design and our conservation officer being mindful of the two the two historic buildings next door. Um, uh, a whole floor was taken off, and also the actual height of the brick uh, brick wall element of the building, you could say, was actually reduced in height as well. Um, and thereby reducing its impact on the setting of the adjacent buildings. Um, there was a, a, a point made about, well, why not propose a, um, it should be a tr more traditional looking building on block B instead of what's proposed, but um, the danger with doing a traditional building there in, 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 in sort of modern form, it could end up um, reducing the, um, having a harmful impact on the setting of the adjacent buildings and, and competing with it um, so, in having something that's that's much more modern in design, it reflects the, the uh, you know wh where we are. Um, we think actually works works well with the adjacent building, and now the height's been reduced. Uh, the servicing has been has been um, been completed. Um, as I said, highways objected uh, uh, at the during the process to servicing off Kingston Road, so we've um, they've had to accommodate accommodate that um, round round on Brisbane Road. Um, and so overall, um, we think this is a good, um, a good development for, for Kingston Road and in particular um, provides sort of long term use of, of the um, former Manor Club building. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Officer Bryson. Uh, I have a written speech from Councillor Benbow. Uh, so, Louise, would you be able to please read that? Thank you, Chair. I fully welcome the historical building Manor Club being restored and converted into flats after being left unused for some years. However, I do have grave concerns about the second proposal, Block B, next door to the, at the former Wimbledon carriage site, with the erection of a new four-storey residential block, including the basement level, which needs to be scrutinised tonight. My chief concerns are about the poor design of the second proposal, Block B, on the corner of Kingston Road and Brisbane Avenue too big and too unsightly. It is completely out of character and certainly will not fit into the old Merton Park area, along with the historical buildings of the Manor Club and Merton Hall and the Victorian and Edwardian terraces. Merton Hall and the Manor Club are two of the more important buildings concerning the street scene and contributing to the character of the area. This is a sensitive site and any new development should be similar in scale and sympathetic to these two buildings. The design of any new proposed development should show some rec recognition of the context of the site and have a relationship to the area. From the South Wimbledon Local Planning Policy N3.5.C, it states, to supporting developments that help improve or strengthen, strengthen the character of the main roads. The this development, in my opinion, vastly alters the appearance of Kingston Road due to the imposing height and size of the structure. Then there is a danger of losing the historical character of old Merton Park area and seriously needs to be reconsidered. The height of Block B, four storeys, amended from six storeys, is still too high and the surrounding buildings would be totally dwarfed, like the nearby Madison Heights building at the end of Nolan Road and is a sore site. The proposed balconies will overlook either neighbouring gardens or an extremely busy road with the attendant noise and fumes will will be hardly suitable for recreational use and will be more likely be used for drying washing or storing bicycles etc and will be unsightly. Also it will be unsafe to use due to the level of air pollution, noise and disturbance from traffic on Kingston Road. The parking is going to be a major issue and would add more congestion. Yes the development includes car free scheme but there are similar schemes at Spur House and Madison Heights on Milner Road and it is never enforced and are openly flouted by the use of permits issued by the council or by the abuse of annual visitors permits. Rather than opposing the second block, it needs to be sent back to the drawing board and redesigned to the same character as the Manor Club elements of the development. The roof needs to be pitched, not a flat roof, and a tiled materials as opposed to the profiled metal cladding. All balconies should be removed and stick oddly, oddly red bricks for the entire, entire building 
the height should be ideally the same as the Manor Club and Merton Hall. That would be at least more consistent with the area. I understand the increased pressure on the council to deliver new housing as a result of the draft London plan, but local residents must be heard first. This vision for South Wimbledon must be ambitious with a focus on quality to ensure that future development can be sustainable. I therefore strongly urge all the councillors on the panel to agree with my proposal to have Block B redesigned to fit into the beautiful historic part of South Wimbledon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Louise. Um, so we'll open up the questions to panel members. Uh, questions, please. Okay. Oh, uh, Councillor McGraw. Uh, thank you. Uh, why didn't it go to the DRP? Uh, thank you. Um, so we, in discussions with our um, design officer, um, he, he, he felt that it didn't need to, um, given the, the size of the scheme. Um, so it's a, it's a medium sized scheme. Um, but he felt it, it wouldn't be worth um, presenting to, to, to DRP um, on those grounds and that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon? Could you unmute your microphone, please? Thank you. Very well. Um, the, the developer where they spoke talked about um, affordable housing, which was... Um, they didn't say how much, they said 26 residential altogether, including affordable housing. How much of that is affordable? So Chair, on page 326, we have affordable housing section. Um, so it's seven, seven affordable units are proposed, which equates to 27% of the total number. Um, the application was submitted with viability report, which has been independently reviewed by our, our assessors. Um, and seven shared ownership units is is what can be delivered on the site um, at that mix. Um, so um, so that is that is that is welcome um, by us. Although yes, it is it is short of the, of the policy requirement, but it has been subject to viability review. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Comments, please. Councillor Southgate. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that it's quite a high profile site and the you know, it's attracted some 99 objections, this application, um, and also if we look at the contentious history of, of Merton Hall next door, it really has not had the attention it deserves I, I you know with respect to mr bryson a, a real mistake not to refer it to the drp and i do agree entirely with councillor bembo that it, 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 if we're going to respect the legacy of the wimbledon carriage company that stood on this site then we should be looking for something much more traditional in the style. I, I would like to see something that more echoes the uh you know, the, the characteristics of the, the Manor Club, it's soon to be locally listed. I'm, I'm delighted that's to be restored. And I think we could get something far more sympathetic both to the Manor Club and the Edwardian terraces in Brisbane um, Avenue, Brisbane Road, um, with, with a, a design with more traditional pitch roofs rather than this very blocky maxing out the number of flaps within the height. Um, it's just, just a big disappointment. I would actually like to propose refusal on the grounds of failing to respect the, the the character of the surrounding old Merton Park area and in particular the Manor Club. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further comments? Councillor Dean? Uh, I, I think some very good points there. Um, it is a good site uh, for housing, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, things move on all the time. Um, everything Councillor Southgate, um, a lot of people would agree with. I also think that um, when you live just behind this and you live in a two bedroom, a two floor house and suddenly you've got this towering over, you can't see the Manor building um, from South Wimbledon. Uh, you won't be able to see it from Brisbane Road. Um, uh, you, you will be able to see it uh, slightly coming from the other direction. Uh, I think the developer should be encouraged to do something here. 
and I, I think his words were very, very uh, uh, right in every way. I think the, the way the ground floor has been dealt with is very good and also the basement. Um, and also the, the housing mix is excellent. So I think there's lots of good things, but it is one hide too many because it hides uh, the soon to be locally listed building. And it is completely the opposite of, of what that little area is. And it just doesn't make any sense. So if he can come back with something that's gonna work, he's gonna accommodate as many people, uh, but he's gonna respect the landscape where this building is. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ward, uh, comments, please. Thank you, yes. Um, the proposal, um, well, the, the view that the um, building at Block B is, is too high, um, I don't think it is in terms of um, the relationship to the rest of Kingston Road as you go down that way um, from College Wood. Um, but the suggestion that it should be reduced by a story um, to better fit in with the objectors here. We currently have seven of the 26, and um, it could change marginally with the um, viability assessment, but seven of the 26 being um, affordable units. If you reduce the stories on the, the um, building B from four down to three, your affordable housing viability on the site will be zero will be absolutely zero. So if you cut the number of stories from four to three, you take out all the affordable housing. The only reason you can put affordable housing in is if you build it that high. It's not um, stupendously out of keeping with everything else in the area. And I think we should absolutely pass the scheme. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ward. Any further comments? Councillor Southgate, would you uh, like to make a proposal? Uh, thank you. Yes, and it, it just just to clarify there, I am actually quite happy with the height at four stories. That is has been reduced by one story from five, and that seems to meet the objection of the of our conservation officer. Um, so it, the quantum in terms of stories is the same, but the the design not. So my motion to refuse really is that it fails to respect the um, context of the Manor Club and, and Merton Hall and coming on the Brisbane um, Avenue side, the, the, the character of the Edwardian houses, which are so much a part of the, the, the character of old Merton Park. Okay, thank you. Do you have a seconder? Yeah, I second that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dean. Uh, right, so I'll, I'll move on to the vote. The first one is for uh, the motion proposed by Councillor Southgate, uh, which is basically a refusal uh, for out of character uh, and misplacement. So those in favour of Councillor Southgate's proposal. Two of us. <laughs> there. Yeah. Let me hold things Oh. Hola, you have three chair. Thank you. Uh, those against uh, the proposal. Seven. Ola, you meant that seven? Yep, seven chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's uh, failed. So we'll now move on to the actual application itself. Those in favour uh, of the application, if you could please put your hands up. I'll make that uh, seven. Yep, so do I. Thank you. Those against? Yes, three. Uh, three? Three. Yep, thank you. Uh, so the application has been granted. Thank you. Uh, I now move on to 
item 11, 8 Pre-Show Crescent. And uh, Officer Lewis, could you please present the scheme? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> can I just confirm that members can see the uh, the images on the screen? Yes, you're good to go. Jonathan. Thanks. Um, this, um, uh, this application, just to be clear, um, unfortunately, the um, location plan was transposed from an earlier, much earlier planning application. And if you could see where the cursor's moving across the screen, that in fact is the site boundary. And all the land to the right of that line is the application site and the sort of the slightly darker hatched area, which the curse is moving across the moment, isn't part of the, um, uh, the site. But that should be a little more clear on the next drawing, which shows um, uh, the site. That's, that's better. Um, so we have um, a site which um, is um, tucked away. It, it, it is in fact um, part of the Mitcham Cricket Green Conservation Area. Um, the, um, uh, the conservation area boundary um, actually runs up where the, um, where the cursor is moving on the, uh, on the screen. Um, historically, it, it was part of a very large back garden to one of the properties on um, pre-shore present, but in more recent years um, has been subdivided. So although it forms part of the, the conservation area, it is somewhat detached from uh, feeling um, a, a part um, of it. Um, it could be read as perhaps um, land to the side of um, Beadle Court, um, or perhaps um, an intervention, a gap um, in, um, I think it's Russell Road, um, to, um, uh, uh, to the north um, uh, of the site. Um, if I can firstly refer members to the modification sheet, uh, you'll see that um, uh, there's a bit, there have been some late submissions. Um, there's also, I think, um, a helpful um, comparison uh, with the refused scheme. Uh, you'll see from the planning history um, on uh, the site um, there was an earlier refusal, if I can refer members to pages 397 and 398 um, of the agenda paper, uh, you'll see there was a, a, a scheme that was refused on grounds of being visually intrusive, harmful impact on neighbours, harmful impact on the conservation area, failing to provide site, safe site layout and concerns regarding um, servicing. But if you go through the points in the inserted paragraph 3.10, um, you'll see how the scheme um, has sought uh, to address um, those concerns. Um, if I can just st stress at the beginning of um, this presentation, the need for a decision this evening rather than a deferral. Um, the officers are bringing this application before um, committee um, in order to inform the um, submissions to the planning inspectorate. There has been an appeal against what's called non-determination, which is in effect a decision by the applicant to go to appeal on the basis that it's been deemed to have been refused. Now the council hasn't refused it at this very moment. Um, so if it's approved, there's clearly the potential that the applicant uh, may withdraw uh, the appeal. Um, if members' views this evening are that the scheme should, however, be refused, then that will help um, officers um, uh, very much in terms of um, presenting uh, their case to the, um, uh, to the planning inspectorate. If I can just take you through some of the other images um, of um, this particular uh, development, I can perhaps reduce the images just a little bit. Let's 
So we can see two, two irregular shaped um, uh, buildings um, on the site, um, trying to sort of wrestle with the, um, uh, the irregular shape um, of this particular parcel um, of land, um, giving rise to, if I could just take you to the elevations. There we go, it's quite a nice roof image of the, of the, of the two shapes. The, um, uh, the building here is two stories, building here is two stories, and here two stories, and then this bit in the centre rises to a third floor of accommodation with some of the accommodation within um, uh, the roof space. The um, elevations perhaps a little bit um, uh, tricky to, um, uh, uh, to interpret. Um, the east elevation is looking what I would, what I would call to um, uh, the site. At the west elevation, that's looking over towards um, Beagle Court. The north elevation, like I said, that's a little bit um, uh, tricky to, um, uh, to, to interpret. What, what the, um, uh, uh, the architect has done here is shown um, uh, how uh, the elevation might look, I, I suppose, without really sort of reflecting the fact that the building cranks into uh, the site. So we have one of the existing dwellings where the gap is in the street, then the first building, and then roughly at this point, the building begins to turn and crank um, into uh, the site. It's perhaps a little more easy to perceive that when you're looking at the back uh, of the building um, here. Plain, simple, um, tiled roofs, um, facing brick, um, quite a, a careful and thoughtful use um, of, I can just take you a bit further up. Probably very hard to see on the um, uh, images on the uh, uh, agenda papers, but what the architect has done in order to overcome some of the concerns about overlooking, we've got these sort of little pop out bays and we've got obscured uh, glazing on the front. So that's looking towards the gardens um, of uh, the properties to the north and then clear glass either side. So I, I would suggest quite a thoughtful um, device um, to, to overcome um, overlooking um, issues. Again, the use of obscured glass for some of the kitchen windows, again, to um, try and avoid um, overlooking. Just to give you a bit of bit of context with, there we go, that's the, um, that's the very top floor uh, of, the, um, uh, of the buildings. Just to give you a bit of context, um, the proposals um, would provide, um, like I said, nine, nine units, um, a 30%, 30%, 30% split of one, two and three bedroom family units. So the proposals actually, actually introduce family units um, on this um, uh, site as well as um, smaller. Um, units. There you can see uh, one of the um, uh, properties on uh, Preshaw Close, uh, so, uh, Preshaw Crescent, that's the, the, the one where I'd said um, had, it had previously had a, a much larger garden which has now been truncated. And this is again to give you a bit of context on the side roads um, around um, uh, the site where you can see um, there's um, quite narrow um, carriageways. Again, that's looking towards the site, you can just see the entrance, or what would be the entrance to the site where the, the arrow is circling in the distance uh, here, a bit more of a close up. Here, so again, roughly where the telegraph pole is, that would be your little driveway into um, this uh, development. And again, looking in. So you can see that there's aspects of the development where you can have uh, clear glazing in some of the windows looking towards the flank wall of Beadle Court and then other bits where you need to introduce uh, the obscured um, uh, glazing. Uh, the site um, is currently fairly overgrown. Um, I visited the site this morning. Um, it still looks pretty much um, uh, like this. Uh, again, looking across the site, that's from the car park at Beadle Court. Uh, so that's 
roughly in here would be the um, two stroke, three story um, part. And then roughly over here would be one of the two story wings. And again, over here, one of the two story wings. And again, just looking at, so that's looking at, again, across the site with Beadle Court um, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the right. Um, what I would say is that um, officers acknowledge um, that this compact development, uh, this is a compact development, and that there are tensions between the support being given to it by officers um, and the comments received from the conservation officer, because I'm sure you'll pick up on the fact that the conservation officer um, has not um, been particularly positive towards this um, uh, proposal. Um, what I would stress is that recommendations are routinely based on weighing up the pros and cons of various planning objectives. Given the likely increase in housing targets for the borough, it may be considered that significant weight can be given to delivering additional dwellings on the site and that coupled with a simple but not unattractive design, this scheme might reasonably be supported. What I would say, one of the key issues that's been raised by um, residents um, uh, has been concerns um, about um, servicing uh, to uh, the development. And you'll see that um, officers are recommending that there's um, a pre-commencement condition to ensure that um, uh, 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 servicing uh, and refuse arrangements are properly sorted out. Um, and there may also be concerns about um, uh, access to the site um, for um, emergency vehicles such as fire tenders. But again, I would draw members attention to the fact there's a draft policy now D12 in the um, as yet to be published draft um, London plan, which could provide a hook if members were minded to approve the scheme to require certain details to be submitted um, as um, part of a pre-commencement condition to allay any concerns that members may have uh, about a site like this being inaccessible um, by such emergency vehicles. And the scheme is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, first speaker I have is Tony Burton. Uh, Tony, are you, yeah, if you could please unmute yourself and you have three minutes, thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Tony Burton, Secretary of Mitcham Cricket Green Community and Heritage, the Civic Society for this part of Mitcham. These plans result in the loss of important open space that has never been built on and which makes a positive contribution to Mitcham Cricket Green Conservation Area. The onus is on the applicant to show that it preserves or enhances the conservation area. It fails to do this. The supporting information provided is pitifully weak and the development will have an unacceptable impact. First, most of the open land becomes developed and much is turned into a car park. Some development on the site could be possible, but it should build over much less land and provide much more greenery. Second, the plans intensify development in an already congested area, as your conservation officer says, trying to squeeze too much on the site. This results in a significant loss of local amenity. Third, the design is everyday and ubiquitous. It falls far short of what is required to justify the development of open land in a conservation area. The materials lack local precedent, the balconies are intrusive, and too much green land becomes car park. Fourth, access is highly constrained and the scheme fails to provide a new link between Harwood Avenue and Russell Road. The analysis of how construction and service vehicles will access the site also confirms they will need to mount pavements in an area where residents already have to walk in the street to avoid pavement parking as the norm. Finally, and critically, the committee should be aware that the site was cleared and mature trees removed illegally in 2015. Merton Council has admitted its failure to undertake promised enforcement, and the applicant states categorically, quote, that this occurrence is an embarrassment to the applicant and all involved with developing the proposals for this development. And I'll something that we we all wish to put right as part of the development process. This has not happened. The value of the meagre five trees proposed, most of which are inappropriate species, is but a fraction of those lost. The applicant should be required by condition if necessary to live up to their promise to put things right and replace trees of at least equivalent value. 
The plans will harm the conservation area. We ask you to send a clear message to the appeal inspector by rejecting them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Burton. Uh, next speaker I have is Michael Phillips. Uh, Michael, are you with us? Yes. Uh, we can't hear you. Michael, uh, could you try unmuting your... Uh... It's unmuted. That's better. Yep, you have three minutes. Perfect. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, good evening, uh, panel members. Um, I speak to oppose approval on behalf of the residents of Russell Road, Glebe Path, Love Lane, Pressure and Pressure Crescent, and the opposition is unanimous. I refer the committee members to the separate individual written representations by residents, all of which are adopted. It is a lot more detailed, given that um, we've got just three minutes, and I invite the members to consider the contents. Uh, the first of, is the issue of health and safety. There is a gas pipe installation located underneath the bend of Russell Road, by the entrance to the proposed development. This was flagged up as far back as 2016, but has not been addressed in, and even in the current uh, submission. There's a great danger of heavy construction vehicle traffic into the proposed development, causing the road to collapse and potential rupture of that gas pipe. There's also a serious risk of damage to the main sewer uh, on Russell Road. Similarly, there are perennial problems about sewage leakage in rear gardens of properties on Glee Path and Pressure Crescent and uh, the properties in Russell Road on the southern side. And there's also the constant blockage of the main sewer located on Russell Road. These have not been satisfactorily addressed by the developer. The de developer purported to address it by deflecting responsibility to the utility companies. It acknowledged high groundwater levels uh, uh, in the area, but has conveniently suggested that monitoring would be uh, sufficient. This is what is contained in the under site underground services report. We do not, uh, we find this most unacceptable. The current resident of 26 Russell Road, which is a property which abuts the proposed development, wrote the council in December 2019, again to express concerns about the gas installation and the fact that the erection of the block would, block, would cut off sunlight to the back garden and negate the advantage of the south facing garden. The south facing garden was why the property was purchased in the first place. Furthermore, the council in the notice letter of 14 December 2019 had represented uh, the, proper, the proposed development as a type E manor dwelling. One minute left. This is a gross misrepresentation, and we cannot stress enough that nine units in a former back garden is unreasonable and most unrealistic. The other is the issue of um, road safety. The design and access information statement submission has failed to fully address the serious practical difficulties with very narrow, reduced road width, 2.8 meters with packed cars on the access road. Russell Road provides access to several other roads, Howard Close and Love Lane. Currently, emergency services experience difficulties with access. Russell Road and Clip residents have a long history of grossly inadequate parking spaces and the constraints of very narrow two-way traffic roads, which have recently been exacerbated by the parking restrictions introduced to the neighboring Love Lane and adjoining roads. The local residents are very concerned and find unacceptable the serious inconvenience and practical problems that will be experienced by residents and also uh, not just during the constru construction, but post the completion. The development will worsen what is already serious issues for residents as they don't exceed the on-site parking. The, the residents of Russell Road and Glee Park find it unacceptable that the highways consultant report uh, has made recommendations uh, about parking restriction. Phillips, I have to stop you there. It's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right, my next speaker is Kay Collins from Solve Planning. Good evening, thank you very much. Um, yeah. you we have... please not... Sorry, you okay for me to continue? Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I won't speak for six minutes, it's, it's far too late for that, just to cover a few issues as, um, as we proceed. Um, what I wanted to do is not go over the application because we've got a very comprehensive officer's report in front of us. But um, just to clarify a couple of points, one on the appeal that's currently been submitted and also just a couple of comments to come back to the, those issues raised by the residents. Um, the application, this application is a resubmission of a scheme that was refused, not resubmission, but it's a revised scheme from one that was refused 
last year it was resubmitted in December. We were making good progress on the application with, indeed, with some positive comments from, from officers for which we're grateful. Um, and we were, we were almost getting to the point where we were resolving some of the issues. And then um, lockdown happened in March. <laughs> and um, with, with the you know, unfortunate impact that has on all our working practices. Um, for contractual reasons, unfortunately, we were in a position where we had to submit an appeal to progress this or to be seen to be progressing this application. So that's why we're in the position we are today with the appeal. Um, we're very pleased to see, obviously, the recommendation for approval from officers. We think it it's a good scheme. It reflects some, some close working with officers um, on the previous scheme, but also this one to in the design and the general layout of the site. Um, and, and we're happy that... Um, to, to, to hold that appeal in abeyance if this um, application the committee tonight is successful, just so we can work in a positive way with the with the officers. The appeal is not intended to be there as a as holding anyone to ransom. It really was just for a contractual purpose to to enable us to proceed with the application. And if we can work positively with officers, we would prefer to do that. And the the obviously the the committee report or the officers report you've got in front of you will enable us to do that moving forward. Um, a couple of points just to this raised by um, the residents who spoke previously. Um, on the tree issue, clearly that's a, a very emotive one. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's a shame that the trees were removed, but we are where we are. My um, what's, what's happened is the tree planting um, proposal we've got in front of us, we all agreed with the council um, a good few years ago as part of previous submissions. And it's entirely obviously our, our intention to to put that to put that right with this tree planting. Um, we haven't had any comments on the landscaping proposals that have been put forward as application because as far as we're aware they they meet with those requirements made by the tree officer previously in response to the trees that were being removed and indeed those landscaping details will be dealt with by condition and controlled as such and and as a normal condition if those trees were to die in you know in 10 years in five years from the date of that they were planted they would be replaced so there's there's a there's a me mechanism where that where, whereby that can be protected um Obviously, transport highways is a key issue in this location. And um, Russell Road, as you've seen from the photos posted by the officer, are, are um, it's a tight access. There haven't been. We've, we've obviously uh, undertaken all the appropriate highways um, work and to make sure everything works. There haven't been any objections from transport or highways officers in relation to that access. The only issue that that was outstanding in March when, when um, we went into lockdown was to do with waste disposal and obviously the officers report in front of you deals with that by which we're, which we're more than happy to accept as a pre-commencement condition and indeed you mentioned that the London plan, draft London plan policy to deal with emergency vehicles, again more than happy that that's dealt with by, by, a pre, by way of a pre-commencement condition. Um, thank you for your time, that's all I want to say um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Officer Lewis, uh, do you have any uh, comments you'd like to make? Well, I think the, um, uh, the planning consultants um, uh, provided um, members with sort of a clear indication of the context of the appeal, which I think is, is very helpful. Um, um, Tony Burton's um, comments are noted in terms of um, proposals should preserve or enhance uh, the character and appearance of the conservation area um, and uh, again you know I, I would invite members to consider the context of this particular um, plot of land and how it relates to the character and appearance um, of uh, uh, the conservation area. Does, does introducing buildings on a site like this um, preserve it? Um, does it have a neutral um, impact or does it um, enhance um, it? I feel that buildings are of um, uh, a suitable quality, um, and um, it could be it could be argued that the proposals um, enhance um, uh, the conservation area. Uh, in terms of trying to to squeeze too much onto the site, um, again, this is something which is a matter of judgment um, for um, members to, to to reach a decision um, on uh, this evening. I don't know whether or not the um, transport officer wishes to make any comments um, about um, access um, to the site or whether or not the planning officer um, wants to um, make any comments about uh, the condition about uh, servicing and refuse. Uh, 
Um, no, okay, fine. Um, are you happy for I'll move on to questions by members. Uh, any questions, please? Councillor Ward, you first. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the um, development is proposed to have six car parking spaces within it, which um, for nine um, units satisfies the London Plan standards. Um, also, it says that the area, um, particularly Russell Road, which is very narrow, um, <clears throat> is in a controlled parking zone. And it doesn't specifically say in the report whether any residents of the new nine blocks would be eligible for a permit to park in a controlled parking zone. I'm assuming not, but um, I'd like clarification on that, please. Can the transport officer um, um, help on, uh, on that? Uh, Sarah, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Russell Road is a very narrow road. And we have, um, we cannot uh, ask them to have a permit free. Uh, there's a, a round, it's not the CBZ, it's not around Russell Road. So around the uh, neighborhood, uh, roads are CBZ. So there's a reason it's not asking for a permit free option on this case. Uh, copy. Uh, Sarah, you, can you please unmute yourself again? Can't hear you. Do you hear me that? Uh, yeah. It's the permit free option is not available on this case. Um, having seen uh, the construction vehicles, we can condition accordingly if uh, vehicles cannot come into the site. Uh, we had to uh, uh, stop some of the on-street on parking for the particular days. That can be conditioned uh, accordingly. Um, uh, everybody is safe. This is a narrow, very narrow, 2.5 to 2.8 meter wide access road. And uh, there could be difficulties for most of the construction vehicles to come in and out of the site at any one time. Um, parking is, uh, the, whatever the parking they have, six spaces is uh, adequate for a development on this site. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Ward, is that, are you asking another question from your previous one? If you could unmute yourself, please. Yeah, yeah, I'll follow up, please. I'm, I'm, I'm less sure about that now. I mean, the report says that the area is in a controlled post parking zone. The officers seem to suggest that Russell Road is not a controlled parking zone and that we can't say the new development will be par permit free. So if there are six parking spaces for the nine flats, uh, the nine units in that development, and between those nine units, they have seven cars between them, would the extra car be able to park on Russell Road, would be able to get a permit to park on Russell Road, which is already very narrow and very full of parking. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm sorry, I'm not clear. If, if six parking spaces isn't enough for this new development and there are three extra cars most days, where will they park? And can they park on Russell Road? Can they get a permit to park on Russell Road? Or do they need a permit to park on Russell Road? Chair, to the, to, to the best of my knowledge, Russell Road itself isn't subject to um, CPZ uh, controls. Yeah. Um, so, so residents, if, if they could find a space, could park um, on that road. Having said that, um, given the numbers um, of uh, units and given the, given the data which TFL gathered um, about half a dozen years ago, only 69% of all households in Merton have access uh, to one, to, to one um, or more cars. So uh, looking at it in, in, in that respect, um, the proposals 
not only meet London plan standards, but in terms of um, the evidence from which we're making our assessment, it would suggest that you know you, you can't automatically assume that because you're introducing new one one bedroom flats that every one of those flats or every one of the two bedroom flats occupiers would necessarily have a car the site's got fairly good public transport accessibility it's within a short walk of the town center it's that balance again to be struck between the amount of development and the amount of car parking that you think should be provided. But uh, as, as I've said, you know, th th this is not a scheme which, um, you know, is, 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 is spacious and is easily accommodated on the site. I acknowledge it's a compact development, but it's a compact development which officers feel could be supported. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wood, I've got quite a few other councillors asking questions, so if I've got time, I will come back to you. So I've got Councillor Lanning, Councillor Henry, and then Councillor Makin. Councillor Lanning, please, uh, questions. Thank you, Chair. It's just a question on private amenity space. Um, on page 401, the Conservation Officer says that there's not enough amenity space, but then on 407 of the report, it says that private amenity space is sufficient, but I don't think we actually have um, any details about the, the private amenity space that each um, flat has in the report. So it's just a question as to whether or not they meet the standards. Chair, I'm sorry if the, um, the information um, hasn't been included um, in uh, uh, the report, but certainly looking at um, the drawings, um, all the dwellings um, have um, patios, um, small decks, terraces, um, balconies, um, all of which appear to um, meet uh, the necessary standards. I, I think the conundrum here is that you, you've got um, uh, three bedroomed, um, potentially family sized um, units, but because they're, they're maisonettes, um, the standard of uh, amenity space is significantly lower than the council standard had it been a more conventional dwelling. See, so even though it may look as if there's not a lot of uh, amenity space, um, you've got to apply our um, policies carefully when reaching that conclusion. Could I just come in? The um, the individual yeah. amenity space for the units meets the standards. Yes. I think what the conservation area officer was showing in communal was more of a reference to whether it would be a larger communal space around the side of the site as opposed to actually meeting the space for individual residents. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Chair. Okay, on page 409, um, 7.12, where the triggers are concerned, um, can you um, explain or tell us whether or not the, uh, the applicants had agreed to replace the trees? And if they do, whereabouts on the, um, the plan will it be um, replaced, please? Lee, do you, do you want to respond to um, uh, to that on uh, on tree plan? Yeah, the, 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 the tree the tree the trees are indicated on the um, ground plan. Um, there was uh, some concerns that the species that were initially submitted um, could be improved, and um, it does. We have put a a proposed a condition there that the replacement trees do meet a uh, suitable cabot standard. Um, so that we get good quality trees in, re in replacement of the ones that, of some of the ones that have been lost. So that would be something that would be resolved by condition. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Makin. Um, could you go back to the plan of um, the development as to what you've seen? Because the one you've sent me is very small. I can't see it. Right. That's um it looks it looks very large for the site to start with. Um 
emergency vehicles can't get in to the site at all without trespassing on, on neighbour's properties. Um, in fact, big vehicles won't be able to do that either. Um, the answer to the CPZ question was that Russell Road has not got a CPZ, but is suffering from the cars that are, can't park in Love Lane anymore and do park in Russell Road and surrounding roads. It means some of the cars parked there do not belong to Russell Road residents, but that does that won't make it any easier to park. Um, I can't see really any difference between the two schemes, the one that was refused and this one, apart from you've moved the building back a bit, but that means that the resident in um, Beadle Court will suffer now because they'll be overlooked. Um, Chair, the, um, uh, the design of the scheme um, is such that um, the proposals, as I've said, where you have clear glass, that's looking towards the flank wall of Beagle Court. Um, and then for the other part of the development, if I can just go back to sharing the screen, if I may, um, uh, with you again. Um, if we look, so we've got um, at ground floor level, you can put a fence in, so um, not an issue there. But this is the flank wall of Beadle Court, um, and 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 that's 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 just a a, a complete um, um, brick wall. Um, so um, if if I can just um, quickly scroll down to the um, uh, the photographs of the site again yes so some of the windows will look across the car parking area of beadle court other windows will look towards well you can't see it here i'll see if i can see if there's another photograph that there we go so other windows will look towards that um, elevation. So I, I, I would suggest that by placing a building, by placing a building roughly in here, the windows will either look across the car park or at the bottom of the screen, the windows will look towards the flank wall. And at ground floor level, there's 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 a you, you can put a fence in in any event. Uh, okay. Um, Can we actually? Uh, okay. Um, as I said, I, if you could be quick, uh, Councillor Macon, do you have a follow on question? Yeah, I want to ask about uh, play areas for children as well, because that's come up before. And we haven't got, uh, it doesn't look to me like 50% of the land is land, built more than footprint. They've covered as much as possible on that area. Than they can. Um, Chair, the um, uh, the requirement for, for providing um, communal play space for children um, would normally um, uh, relate to um, major developments and relate to the child yield from uh, schemes. So, uh, a scheme of this um, size, we're, we're looking at nine nine dwellings. Um, it's not a major development. Um, and so uh, in, in, in that respect, our focus would be on ensuring that there was um, good quality space um, around uh, the buildings um, rather than um, some form uh, of um, designated play space um, for uh, the children. Um, again, I don't know whether or not the planning officer um, wishes to, to, to add anything to that. Yeah, no, all I'd say was that, yes, you're quite right, it doesn't require... Um meet the requirements for a child play space um so often with the bigger developments there's space to put that play area where it wouldn't impact anybody if you were looking to do a child's play area here the only place would be against the uh, fence of the property at 26 and i would hazard a guess that that was something they wouldn't really be appreciative of having a children's play area there so as jonathan said it is not required and each unit has its own um individual amenity space Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Any further? Council, what did you want to ask uh, one final question or should I move on to comments? Yep, okay, thank you. Comments, please. Councillor Christie. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I would I would just say that um, in the discussion, there was mention of a um, condition to ensure that the developer uh, put forward their emergency vehicle access plan. And I would ask that that was um, adopted. And also the uh, there was mention of a condition to ensure that the um, replacement trees were uh, you know, had sufficient longevity or were replaced in the event that they, you know, didn't take or, or, or died or whatever. And I would ask that that uh, is adopted as well. Thanks. Chair, may I respond to Councillor Christie? Yes, please. Yes, please do. Um, London, Pl London Plan Policy D12 on fire statements um, says um, that um, the policy requires development proposals to achieve the highest standards of fire safety, embedding these at the earliest possible stage. Um, so this could be a technical solution within the building rather than necessarily designing the scheme somehow that a fire tender can get into the site. Um, but um, you know, what I would say is that officers have a perfectly legitimate hook on which to attach a suitably worded condition to allay the concerns that councillors may have about ensuring fire safety for this development. I, I mean, I suppose the point of, of me asking for that is because I, I, I do have some concerns about the restricted access to that uh, site. So whatever means you have to ensure that that is um, applied. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Councillor Ward. Do you have any comments? No? Right. So uh, I'd like to move on to the vote, uh, please. Those in favour, please put your hands up. I can count seven, Chair. Seven? Yeah, thank you very much. Those against? Three, Chair. That's it. And I think that's a, a total of 10. So it's uh, granted. Thank you. I then now move on to item number 13, 33 to 39, Upper Green East, uh, Mitcham. Uh, Officer Lewis, could you please uh, present the case? Thank you. Can I just confirm that members can see the images um, on, uh, yep. on the screen? Yes, Jonathan, you're good to go. Okay, thanks. If I can, if I can just um, direct members' attention to uh, modifications um, sheet, um, you'll see there's some. Um, there were some concerns about some of the images um, that uh, hadn't come out um, very well on uh, the printing of the agenda, uh, but the case officer has um, inserted uh, a number of um, 3D um, images um, of uh, the development, um, which hopefully will assist you in um, uh, forming a, a decision on this application. Um, you'll also see um, there's reference to um, changes to uh, the use classes order, which are due to come into effect. Now, the use classes order um, sets out um, a, a whole number of categories of uses of buildings, um, 
which um, planning policies relate to and over which um, planning um, authorities control you changing one category of uses to another. This will be changed as from the beginning of September. And the purpose of the note on the mod modification sheet is simply to alert you to the fact that um, given the time between making a decision on this application, if it's approved and signing off um, a decision, it'll be necessary to reconfigure the wording of that condition so as to ensure that it's consistent uh, with the new use classes um, order. So at this very moment, the approach that officers will take will be to endeavor to merge the proposed mix of uses that the applicant wishes uh, to uh, be able to be used uh, on the ground floor of this building and um, reflect that in uh, a new condition which will um, incorporate those uses which broadly speaking uh, might be considered uh, town center uses. So um, A1 uh, uses shops, A3 uses cafes and restaurants, um, D1 uses such as doctor surgeries and dental practices, um, uh, but again, the, the new use classes are slightly different, uh, but um, officers will ensure that the uses are, are very much focused on, on town centre um, uh, uses here. Um, if I can just take you through, I think we've actually got some quite good images um, of uh, the proposals. At the moment, we've got this rather tired um, um, uh, couple of buildings um, on, on uh, uh, the site. Um, mm -hmm. And just goes to the, the photographs at the foot of um, of this pack. Right, so we've got um, uh, this building on the um, uh, the right of the image. That's to be demolished. The building on the left of the um, uh, photograph, that's um, also um, uh, to be demolished. Again, some, some shots of the, um, uh, the site. And you can see rather unusually that one of the buildings which is to be demolished, the one that's got the, um, the pizza chicken grill um, uh, sign, uh, that projects forward of the fairly modern um, Barclays Bank um, uh, building and again looking away from the site uh, towards um, uh, Mitcham uh, the, the pond um, on uh, uh, the edge of, um, uh, uh, of Mitcham uh, uh, conservation uh, area. Um, just to be clear I think the building just about here is the first building um, in uh, the conservation area the buildings which are sort of roughly towards you from the traffic light um, are not uh, in uh, the conservation uh, area. Um, again, some more images of the, um, of the buildings further south and then looking towards uh, the town centre. So the buildings that would go would be this building, um, and this building, if I can now take you to some of the um, computer generated images um, of uh, the development, which have been um, prepared by um, the local architecture, uh, architects practice, Marcus Beale uh, uh, Associates. If we look down on the site, so we're looking at a, a mixed use development comprising um, something in the order of uh, about 500 uh, square meters of uh, flexible commercial space. When I say flexible, uh, the building's designed that you can see a number of um, elements that, that, that define um, this building, um, but in between you've got um, shop fronts which would enable the building to be used for one, two, three um, uh, units, four, uh, these commercial um, uh, uses. Let's just go back up to the, here we go, that's, that's probably a better image to, um, to focus on. 
Um, so we've got uh, commercial space on the ground floor um, and then 20 flats um, uh, above. You can see that that rather awkward projection has been erased as a result um, of this um, proposal. So in fact, a little bit of the space in front of the building where that planter um, is shown, in fact, is the application site. It's not part of the um, uh, adopted uh, highway. So any resurfacing of that, um, our officers would want to ensure it was blended in effectively with um, uh, the, uh, the recently refurbished part of the, uh, of the town centre. Um, again, some, uh, some images of the, uh, the proposals. If I can take you to the 3D image. So this is looking um, at the site uh, from uh, the little courtyard, um, uh, regal court, um, to the um, uh, to the rear uh, of the um, uh, of the building. Again, looking down into um, uh, the uh, development. With um, this is the building that will be facing towards um, uh, the town centre. This is the back with small courtyards um, and uh, and terraces. I can just go to here. We go. So we've got um, the recently um, uh, refurbished town centre um, area. Here we have the uh, uh, the new building rising to to four floors. We've got a wing which runs rearwards um, towards um, Regal Court. This is the car parking area for Regal Court. We've got. A building which is set away from the front of this dwelling here. You can just see again it's set away from the side of the building um, uh, there um, and again the edge that you can see um, here um, is next to um, some open land at the rear um, of um, uh, the bank um, building. Again an image looking down on the development. So this is the open car park land at the back of uh, Barclays Bank. We've got uh, the new building coming in um, here. This is in fact replacing a building which is, uh, there is already a building which is about sort of one and a half stories high um, along this um, elevation um, in any event. Um, but again, compact, town centre uh, development um, with um, a, a number of um, appropriate uh, uses. Um, disappointingly, um, you'll see from the, um, uh, the report, uh, the scheme um, is, um, appears unable to uh, deliver um, uh, affordable housing. Um, as with all these things, um, officers um, do ensure that there's um, proper scrutiny um, of um, the figures um, before we put a report um, to you. And there's been some to and fro between um, the council's um, uh, independent, or sorry, the independent assessors um, appointed to review um, this scheme. Um, and like I said, frustrating as it, as it might be, um, we, we have to take um, the um, uh, advice um, from the uh, surveyors um, in good faith um, and um, uh, ensure that any section 106 that's configured um, at least ensures that there's some clawback mechanism um, uh, provided um, in, in this particular instance. Um, so like I said, the, the scheme delivers uh, a compact development um, which we can we, which we feel uh, wouldn't have uh, an undue um, unduly harmful impact on neighbor amenity. And it's recommended for approval subject to completion of the Section 106 agreement and conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Officer Lewis. Uh, I have uh, the first speaker, Tony Burton, uh, from the Mitcham Green Community Heritage. Tony? Well, again, uh, I'm Tony Burton, Secretary of Mitcham Cricket Green Community and Heritage, the Civic Society for this part of Mitcham. It's remarkable that the centre of Mitcham still retains a village feel. Despite the traffic and all its other challenges, the combination of narrow building plots and modest building heights, 
with fair green at its heart and long views in and out to Three Kings Peace gives Mitcham a special character. We share the Mitcham Society's heartfelt warnings about the impact of these plans on that special village feel. Demolishing a modest parade of shops, riding roughshod over the historic building blocks, and building a four story block of flats that will intrude on the vital visual link between Fair Green and Three Kings Peace is the wrong future for Mitcham. It will set a dangerous precedent for others to follow. To cause this much grief, and then fail to provide any affordable homes, rub salt into the wound. We've followed this scheme closely. It has not improved over time. When new information on the view from the conservation area was provided, it confirmed our worst fears, a bland and, inc and incongruous elevation which conflicts with the existing pitched roofline. The same was true when lavender render and lavender mosaic tiles were added, a disingenuous and lazy design response that entirely overlooks the plethora of authentic design details in nearby buildings that could have been used for design inspiration. Your own urban design officer's profound criticism that the proposals are, quote, entirely unacceptable, that its architecture is, quote, designed to be viewed from a fast moving vehicle from a distance, and that its visual impact is, quote, like a puffed out chest trying to draw attention to itself, applies much to the plans before you as the original proposals. The changes made do not address the fundamental problems which have been identified. The plans also fall down on details such as the mean entrance and the failure to address the impact on Regal Court and improve left. its public realm. Mitcham needs new development. We all know that, but the development it needs should respect and enhance Mitcham's special character. This development does neither. It is in conflict with the development plan, including policies CS14, DMD1 and DMD2, and we ask you to reject it. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony. Sandra Vogel, uh, could you please unmute your microphone? And can you hear us? Yes, hello. Um, Sorry, my name's Sandra. Yep. Okay. Please. Yeah, please start three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sandra Vogel. I'm secretary of the Mitcham Society, and I'm speaking to you tonight to ask you to refuse permission for this application. Now, if it's built, this development will dwarf um, the two and one story buildings that gently run from Regal Court to Three Kings Pond and Cricket Green Conservation Area. If you look in the other direction towards Fair Green, it is taller than Barclays Bank, the tallest building currently in uh, the parade. Um, and it is just too tall by a considerable margin. If you cast your mind back a minute or so to the images you were just shown by the planning officer, that is abundantly clear. Um, the design is entirely out of character and through two revisions, no attempt has been made to significantly change this. It's a design which just doesn't have a place in Mitcham Village. Upper Green East is one of the distinctive shopping parades of Mitcham. If Mitcham Village is to have any chance of retaining its village character, development here should be low rise and in keeping with the village feel. It should lead gently to and from Three Kings Pond and the Cricket Green Conservation Area, which it borders. This building doesn't do that. It doesn't blend, it doesn't meld, it jars. It breaks up the rhythm of the route from Three Kings Pond to the grass of Fair Green. It is entirely disrespectful of Mitcham Village, shows no understanding of the importance of Upper Green East as a shopping parade of generally low rise character or of what is needed to enhance Mitcham Village. Your own design review panel and the urban design officer also find serious fault with this application. It must be an embarrassment to the architect that he is on the DRP when they have criticized its design so severely. They said its horizontal emphasis in a street, streetscape that is characterized by narrow vertical frontages means it fails to respond to its surroundings. It's a design failure. They called it overdeveloped and well, overbearing. Yeah. They gave it an amber rating. Even the architect's peers thinks this development isn't fit to be built. Look at your papers and read the urban design officer's comments. I don't think I've read anything as damning of a development proposal in a long time. They describe the development as failing to understand its place, setting and purpose. They say, you've heard, it looks like a puffed out chest. 
drawing attention to itself rather than uh, reflecting the historic plots it sits on. They say the frontage is fundamentally flawed and simply incorrect. They say it's overly chunky. It lacks the human scale necessary in a small urban green. It visually intrudes uh, into fair green in what they call an entirely unacceptable manner. This development is unfit for Mitchell Village. It doesn't respond to its surroundings. We urge you to refuse permission. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, Marcus Beale, uh, the agent. Uh, Marcus, you have six minutes. And could you please unmute your microphone? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I suppose point number one is to commend your officer for doing a very, very thorough report and covering off all the comments that have been made by the objectors this evening. I think point number two is to thank the people who care enough about this site, including Tony and Sandra, um, for making these comments. We've heard a lot of adjectives. Um, I think architecture and urbanism has to actually work in the same way that a, a plane or a car might look very pretty, but if it doesn't go very fast or fly, it's not very useful. So I'd like to say something about the design that is not adjectives, not taste, not style, something that's evidence-based. So the evidence is the historic development of Mitcham, the maps, the map progressions, the grain of the city, the grain of the townscape. And we've split this site into four distinct parts to reflect the grain of the, the town and the historic grain. It's not the most attractive urban environment at the moment, and it's not the safest urban environment. So how can we make it safer? We give it an active frontage, we give it residential uses above, and we allow overlooking, not only to the front of the building, but sideways, north and south, because of the way the building steps in and out at the front. <clears throat> The character of Mitcham, is it too tall? It's four stories at the front, it goes down to two stories at the back. Is that too tall? We've done a lot of serious research over the last two years and engaged in discussions with a lot of people. Daylight, sunlight analysis and so on and so forth. I suggest it's not too tall and your officers recommend approval. The comments that the objectors make, the adjectives they quote, relate not to the scheme that's before you tonight. They relate to earlier versions of the scheme. The scheme went to design review panel in 2018, two years ago. It's been in planning a year, and it's been in pre-planning a year before that. So the comments that are being recycled to you this evening are not about the scheme that you're asked to determine. I'd just like to rehearse for you some public benefits of the scheme. We're enlarging the pavement, we're widening the pavement, we're giving land back to the public domain. We're providing 20 double aspect, fully compliant, high ceilinged, naturally lit, naturally ventilated, healthy homes for ordinary people to live in. This isn't a house extension in Wimbledon Village. It's 20 good flats in Mitchell. And we're providing a, a, a anchor store for Mitchum, a, a, a commercial unit that can actually attract a good viable use and which can be adapted over the lifetime of the building, if necessary, to other uses. No. So I urge you to support 
of this. It's sustainable environmentally, has green roofs, has renewable energy, high energy efficiency, good quality of natural light and daylight. It's sustainable socially because it provides good housing for ordinary people in the centre of Mitcham and it makes the place safer. And it's sustainable economically because we're not building slums for the future. We're building really good quality housing. So I urge you to accept it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcus. Officer Lewis, uh, would you like to make any comments? Um, I, I, I would simply say that um, in the um, uh, the development control uh, team's um, uh, report, um, the planning officer, um, who I should stress is an architecture graduate with a postgraduate qualification in conservation matters, so someone who perhaps I might um, pay some heed to in terms of their assessment, um, has addressed the concerns uh, regarding the design of the building and has set out quite clearly from pages 471 um, onwards a very good critique um, of uh, the design of this scheme and how it responds to some of the criticisms that have been leveled um, against it. So I'm afraid, um, you know, I, when I went to um, Mitcham Town Centre um, uh, uh, today, I felt quite comfortable with, um, with um, her assessment of the proposals um, and uh, the positive impact it would have on the town centre. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... I'd like to open up to the panels for questions, please. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chair. I've got a question about the um, consultation and the responses to the consultation. It states that um, 77 neighbouring properties were, had, had, were received letters in the consultation and that there were well, one comment, which was about the widening of the pavements, which has been addressed, um, two supports, one from the um, Councillor Stanford who represents the ward. And I understand that we don't give out the names and addresses of other people, but it says there were six objections. And I'm on the next page, four, five, no, the page after next, four, five, nine, it says a number of objections were submitted by um, the Mitcham Society the Mitchell Cricket Green Community and Heritage. Um, and so of those, and this is a number of objections were submitted by those groups. So of the 77 neighboring properties we um, sent letters to, we received six objections in total, a number of which were from those Mitchell Society and Mitchell Heritage groups. Were there any objections that came from those 77 local residents that had letters delivered to them? Um, Chair, I'm, I'm just checking on our um, uh, records, um, just so that I can give um, give, give you a, a, a correct answer on um, uh, uh, on this. Um, Chair, um, I, I'm afraid. Um, I've just been told that my password has expired. Um, so I'm afraid I, I can't quite access the information. Um, Neil, I don't know if you've got uh, the M3 um, account um, open where you're working. Uh, that was what I was trying to get into to try and get the information. Okay. Uh, while Officer Milligan's looking, searching for that, uh, Councillor Ladding, would you, could I take your question, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a question about the commercial units. Um, I know on page 459, um, one of the questions was around, um, you know, if uh, if the space wasn't taken up, um, would it be possible to convert to residential? And my question was essentially, are any of those use classes um, part of the use classes that you could have permitted development to change to residential? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's the whole um, uh, thing with um, uh, structuring uh, conditions so as to um, mitigate um, any harmful impact um, on uh, the character or amenities of an area. 
So, for example, um, under normal circumstances, you may have a, a situation where uh, a building could, under the prior approval regime, change from um, retail to residential with just making a, a prior approval submission rather than a planning application. Where we have a new building such as this, um, where the building's never been used uh, for those um, purposes, my understanding of the um, General Permitted Development Order is it doesn't give you that kind of flexibility, but as a belt and braces um, uh, move on the part of uh, the planning authority, we can quite legitimately take away those normal permitted development rights, the reason being to safeguard the attractiveness and vitality of the town centre. So the reason for taking away the permitted development rights would be to serve a sound and policy-based reason. Thank you. Uh, Officer Milligan, have you managed to locate the information? Getting in there now, I'm afraid I didn't have it open, but I'm all, it's opening up for me now. Give me uh, two minutes if you want to carry on. Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, any further questions? Right, I'll move on to comments. Uh, any comments? Councillor Christie, please. Thank you, Chair. Only to say that I uh, actually think it's a, a fantastic design. I think it will be a fantastic addition to this part of um, Mitcham Town Centre and could really sort of refresh that uh, part of the shopping parade there. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to supporting it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Henry? Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I live in Mitcham for 30 years. Uh, this is the best, best thing I've ever seen happening to Mitcham right now. And I do wonder if some of the objectors really have a look at some of those buildings, especially at the back of the buildings. And also, like Councillor Ward, how many of them live in Mitcham? Possibly they may work in Mitcham, but do not live in Mitcham. I just want to say I do welcome this building and I do welcome this application. And I just hope we respect it and keep it as clean, as good as possible. Also, the color lavender, it's something that bring back Mitcham was a lavender feel. So I think that have a statement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Uh, any further comments? Councillor Dean. Yeah, well, I think, um, I, I mean, I don't even think the applicant um, felt very comfortable about, about presenting it. Um, and if, if every building in Mitcham Town Centre looked like that, then it wouldn't be a village. And um, I actually think the building on the right hand side, as you look at it, is just very dilapidated. Whoever owns it has never invested in it since it was built. And that's why it looks so terrible. But actually, it's got a nice design. It's got a long roof. Uh, this block, this square, just looks like anything that goes up today, and it's it's just losing the appeal. So the size is fine in terms of the the uh, properties is fine, but um, all those other old buildings will just disappear now because uh, the opportunity is there. Uh, the council is basically saying to Wimbledon uh, and Mitcham Town Centres, just put up this stuff. There's there's no design work in this at all. It's just square. It's not complicated. And uh, I find the design extremely ugly and I find it, I mean, it's interesting that people talk about living in Mitcham. Um, it's not about living in Mitcham, it's about respecting Mitcham. And um, I've always loved the town centre of Mitcham more than any, any other place in the borough. And I did grow up in the area uh, and uh, I love the way it is, but uh, this will look like wood green, it will look like so many other, like Stevenage. And frankly, it's appalling, and I think we should stand up for good design. I'm very disappointed to see it here. Okay, thank you. Um, any, uh, yeah, Councillor Ward, uh, comments, please? Councillor Ward, we have a reply, we have a response for you. Um, Chair, do you want me to just quickly trot yes, through? The yeah, could you do that, please? Yes. Jonathan, I think in terms of the, the answer to the question, I think it's three I can calculate that seem to be 
more local um, in terms yeah. of objections? Yes. Out of six, yeah. yeah. Can you want to answer your question? Thank you. That, uh, that, that very helpful um, and informs my comments in that um, the one comment and two approvals, that makes three from local people, and there were, say, three against from local people. Um, it's, I think it's a great development. And um, I think the comments of approval are one from one of the elected representatives who does actually represent the area. And it is, I think, slightly worrying that organisations who will say Mitcham needs new development, but will speak tonight against three separate development housing developments in Mitcham. Um, Mitcham does need new development. It does need new housing. We need to buy. We need to build this. And those who genuinely represent the interests of the people of Mitcham do want to build housing. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Uh, any final comments before I move to the vote? No. Councillor Dean, did you want to move a recommendation? I've made my points of disappointment and blandness, um, okay. nothing more to say. I'll ask that, I'll make sure that's noted. So, uh, on to the vote. Those in favour, please could you put your hands up? I'll make that nine, Chair. Uh, those against? One against, Chair. Uh, so that's granted. Thank you. I now move on to, it's nearly midnight, uh, item 12, 50 Timberham Road, Merton Park. Jonathan, it's all down to you now. Sorry, just moment. Sorry for the delay. Can members see the uh, the image? Not yet. Yep, you're all good to go now, Jonathan. Okay, um, this is um, a, a modest um, uh, proposal for. Uh, well, sorry, this is a proposal um, for um, a, a garden uh, building uh, on. Uh, a property on Tivenham Road in um, in Morden. Um, the uh, proposals are to replace um, an existing garage um, with um, a larger um, garage with um, a home gym, a workshop, parking bay, and um, a little shower room. Um, the I can just scroll down through the um, images. There's a flat roof building on the site at, at the moment. I'll show you some photographs in a, a second. Um, it's flanked by um, two um, uh, uh, garage buildings um, of uh, a comparable um, size. The proposal, um, perhaps the, the size of the building is, is, is rather exaggerated by this sort of tile pattern on the, um, uh, on the roof. Um, but we've got a, a building which would span the width of the site and be slightly longer than um, its neighbours. Um, but uh, as I've said, it would be at the end of the, uh, uh, the garden. Uh, the existing front elevation, you can see this um, uh, flat roofed um, uh, uh, garden uh, building. Proposals would have um, a shallow um, pitched uh, roof, again, looking out into the alley uh, at the rear. Um, Broadly speaking, a similar design, albeit with a with a pitched roof. Um, side elevations existing proposed would would change, but a, a larger uh, building. We have some sections again. You can see the block plan. So we've got a building which is 
8.5 meters long, but um, we're still looking at um, uh, a comfortable sort of 19 or 20 meters uh, between the building and the back of the, um, uh, the existing house. That's looking down the garden towards the existing building and that building would be replaced um, by something larger. So this is the um, this is the subject of the uh, of the planning application to to replace a garden building with um, that's looking back towards the uh, uh, the house and that's looking at the building from the alley to the rear again this is the building that would be um, be replaced so a proposal to um, to change that building for um, a larger uh, garden building. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Officer Lewis. Uh, no speakers, so straight on to questions from members. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Southgate. Uh, could you please unmute your microphone? Thank you. There we are. Okay. Um, it's a rhetorical question, really. I, I, why it has to be th over 3.6 metres high? I can't understand for a, a home gym, but um, we do have a condition in there about ancillary to the, the use of the main dwelling, which I think is sufficient to guard against its unintended use as an HMO, so I'm not proposing to, uh, to object to it. Thank you. Any further questions? Comments? Let's move on to the vote. Those in favour? Motion. Sorry. Nine in favour, Chair. Thank you. Uh, those against? Uh, those not voting? One not voting, Chair. So that's granted. Right. Now move on to item 14 planning enforcements. <clears throat> Councillor, uh, sorry, Officer Milligan, do you? Yes, there's there an information report. Um, if there's any queries, then by all means email us about any issues that you're uh, concerned with and we can try and respond. But uh, just there for information tonight only. Thank you. Item 15, um, a review of recent changes to the planning uh, legislation. legislation. Uh, it's late, it's after midnight. Could I please ask members uh, to submit their queries or comments by email? Uh, yep. Alistair is a really pressing question. Councillor Macon, are you saying that you have a pressing question? If you could unmute yourself, please. Yeah. All I'd like to know is from uh, Planning Officer Lewis, if he knows, if, if we, when these are adopted, how many of the things that went through tonight would have would have gone through without coming to the committee? Well, it, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Um, Graham Road, that was one that Tim Bryson presented. I think that was the extra floor on top of the um, uh, the little block of flats in Wimbledon. Um, the the proposed changes which that from being a planning application to an application under the prior approval process. The significance with that would be that whilst there are a number of criteria which um, the planning uh, service can uh, apply, including visual impact, what we will not be able to apply are any requirements relating to um, energy uh, efficiency, floor space standards. 
So that, that would be a case where there would be a change in terms of uh, the way in which we would uh, approach um, uh, the development. Um, in terms of quantifying how many applications would be um, handled differently as a result um, of uh, the changes, I think probably one of the largest impacts would be actually in the town centres, um, because the government's very keen to uh, provide greater flexibility, knowing um, the very tricky situation that lots of town centres find themselves in, uh, to enable um, uh, building owners to um, investigate um, potential tenants uh, for buildings, provided they are town centre uses, without having to go through the town planning um, process. They still need sp space requirements are the same, though, Jonathan. So uh, permitted development has to be within space. Uh, no, in, no. In, in, in terms of um, the new provisions which will be introduced um, by the changes to the secondary legislation, um, the additional criteria which has been um, uh, put in by uh, the government on both this and the other existing prior approval um, schemes um, is to ensure that there's um, adequate natural light. So, so there's no, so if they, each house could be two square metres? Well, um, the, um, uh, the Bartlett School of, of Planning and Liverpool University have recently completed um, a research paper which was tabled to uh, the Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government. And that actually did a study of about um, uh, eight um, or ten local authorities um, and the experiences they've had uh, with um, uh, concerns about um, floor space standards and the overall standard of accommodation being provided as a result of uh, prior approvals. And I think the evidence is mixed. Some areas, um, developers will be very keen to ensure that they don't actually miss out um, uh, in terms uh, of achieving good quality um, conversions. Um, other areas, as Councillor Dean has flagged up, you may get um, rather um, poor um, and small um, uh, units. Um, but it, it's something which I've said to Councillor Latif and I've shared with um, Neil Milligan, um, my manager, um, officers are happy to provide uh, a briefing uh, to um, members um, in the near future, just to give you a feel for what are really quite, quite um, uh, far ranging um, changes um, in planning controls. Uh, my final question on this would be, what would happen <laughs> with metropolitan land? like the Imperial Fields one that we've accepted this afternoon or this evening? I think, I think that's, that's, that's more a case um, of the uh, white papers which um, have come forward, where the government is looking um, to move much more towards um, front-loading uh, the development process with much more detailed working up um, of what might effectively be sort of quasi-planning briefs um, on site so that as part of the development plan process uh, the council would endorse a certain type um, of development and a certain height of development uh, and a certain mix um, of uh, uses and then apply a design code for that site so again that's something which is far more fundamental and wide-ranging um, and that's something which perhaps Tara Butler might be better uh, placed to speak on because the changes which are being proposed by the government's white paper may impact on how our own local plan evolves over the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you very much, Officer Lewis. Um, as uh, Jonathan had mentioned, uh, we're going to try and arrange a, a workshop uh, I think in a presentation uh, on, on the new legislation. So hopefully we'll do that in not too near future. Everyone, thank you very much uh, for the planning uh, committee this evening. Uh, it's late. Uh, we actually had 24 speakers this evening and uh, nine applications and uh, Officer Milligan and Officer Lewis have a 100% record this evening. So <laughs> well done. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. And good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.